Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, 2.30 on uh, March 20th, 2017, and we're having a meeting of the uh, Montgomery County Board of Elections. We have a quorum, and uh, the first thing we're going to do is uh, approve the minutes from February 27th. Is there a motion? I move that uh, we approve the minutes as amended uh, and sent to us uh, uh, late last week. Is there a second? A second. Any discussion? Um, no discussion. I mean, uh, well, I do, I do have one comment. I, obviously, I wasn't here last month, so as to the accuracy of them, I wouldn't be prepared to say. But I, I do know there. it looks like there was some discussion about this House Bill 73. Um, and I wasn't uh, present for any debate that might have occurred on it. This is about the election judges, 16-year-olds. I probably would have opposed that uh, or voted against the motion uh, to support the bill. Um, I don't know if there was any discussion about it or what the, yeah, what the we did. Were, we did have but, to do. Uh, yeah, we did. Um, if I had been here, I probably would have voted against it. So I just wanted to make that clear for the record. Okay. Any other comments? All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. Those are the only minutes we have, Lisa? Yes, sir. Okay. I don't think there's any changes. David, I object. If I don't know if you it was on the record that I wasn't here. I'd like to say I apologize for being late, but I was at a church meeting. No, no, we you we we just started. Here we just thought you were here just for the beginning. Right. There was no reason. You were not late. Thank you. Okay, so we have no changes to the uh, agenda. Correct. Any any pu public comments, Lisa? No. Okay, Margaret. Okay, um, the agenda was posted for the March meeting on March 10, 2017. And uh, regarding status reports, um, Elson and myself attended a conference. I attended it on Friday, March 17th. Um, the topic was the Homeland Security and Elections as a Critical Infrastructure. The speaker was Neil Jenkins, PhD, uh, from the Department of Homeland Security, also Office of Cybersecurity and Communications. Um, and elections as, as a critical infrastructure was declared January 7th of this year, and uh, it's critical. Uh, it's optional for the states. It's not required, but Maryland is one of the 33 states that have asked DHS to assist in risk assessment and testing vulnerability. Um, there's three types of tests, and several tests are performed and recommendations are made to assist the states or counties. Um, the gentleman talked about how the 50 states and no one state has the same structure for election management. Uh, talked about in some states, the it's a very decentralized process that goes, you know, just the city clerk or town clerk to a very top-down uh, process, which is similar to Maryland. Um, he noted that resources are limited in the structure of the election's budget. Vendors have asked for assistance, and the DHS is not at liberty to disclose who they were. And a recommendation from the attendees of the group was for DHS to have a seat at the table when NIST uh, voting groups uh, during the development stage of the technical requirements for the next generation of voting equipment and software. So um, I thought it was worthwhile to find out what is going on on the federal level. Um, uh, Margaret, we didn't receive what you're reading. I, I, this was, uh, I went to this Friday morning, all day Friday. Oh, oh okay, so I it's see. Kind of I, I just, I wanted topic. to make sure I, I hadn't no. missed something in pulling no. it up. Oh, okay. No, that's why. I, uh, anyway, so that that was that conference. So who asked Maryland to be in it? Did we do that? Did uh, this that Maryland to be one of the fifty, one of the thirty-five states or whatever it was? Who, who did that request come from? Well, if you recall, in during the election last September and October, there were two states, Illinois and another state, which I'm forgetting which one, that had some type of cyber attack yeah. on their database. Yeah. So at that point, um, besides the state having their own cybersecurity, uh, the uh, Office of the Department of Human Re uh, Homeland Security offered to the states an opportunity to 
make an assessment of the security on the various structures. <coughs> in, Maryland, in Maryland, and the state board administrator. That's what I wanted to get. The state board does that. It wasn't the governor's office or that. Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay. That's pretty much it for me. I don't know if Allison wants to add anything. No. Okay, personnel. IT completed the postal, is expected to complete the post election maintenance by this Friday. Um, our bilingual clerk vacant position for voting services division is in the interview process at this time. Interviews are expected to begin on Monday. The slowdown there was getting uh, a third member of the panel to interview the individual who is also bilingual. Uh, and uh, they have to pass a certain level of proficiency. Office of Management and Budget and Human Resources approved our department request to fill the vacant position in operations with a reclassified position as op program specialist. The internal procedures uh, have to be completed uh, by HR in this office. Uh, that is expected to be done by Friday, March 24th. And then posting for this uh, position will uh, proceed uh, upon completion of internal procedures and will follow the requirements of human resources. Yeah. Margaret, I had a question. What, uh, how often does the uh, OMB reclassify a position and why would they do something like that? What is the purpose of that? Well, part of the, we requested it. Um, one of the problems that, ha that I inherited when I came here is that every person in this department, aside from the director and the IT person and the deputy, were all uh, clerical positions. And it, um, it was based on the fact that in those good old days, uh, it was a, a pure typing job. Uh, five by eight cards were typed out. Uh, with, there was the voter file. The voter registration was in the file. There was one voter registration file, and then there was these five by eight cards, which we still have, and I'd be happy to show you. And uh, since then, we are now on an Oracle platform. Uh, we are, are the technology that is part of the office, and but getting the jobs upgraded and acknowledging the technical part has been very, very slow. So when it, and, uh, it is, I can only think of one time in all the years I've been here that we were successful in, in moving a classification and that was all of the staff in voter services and absentee. They were all at that time considered principal administrative assistants, which is bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the clerical position and the lowest paid. And uh, we moved them from that position to an office service clerical, and I think that happened in 2008, about. About. And since then, it's just been a piecemeal process. So I guess in your view that, that you would request this because the skills required to fill the position are greater than they were before, and I suppose it would affect the pay that the person would earn who fills That's that correct. position. Mm -hmm. okay. So this used to be a, a clerical position before yes. the reclassification? But this position, yes, it used to be a clerical position. Uh, Brian McKevitt had it. But, I mean, the thing is, today, that position, besides being the campaign uh, uh, person, also is expected to go out and do electrical surveys to make sure that the polling place, you know, has the correct electrical uh, configuration so that the equipment works. Um, they're going to help with uh, uh, doing preliminary schematics for the best flow for polling places. Um, they're coordinating uh, with the school, assisting Chris in coordinating with the schools, county. I mean, it's more than just sitting there typing a sheet of paper. And did Brian just do typing, or did he do those other things that you mentioned as well? He did those other things, too. Well, he signed up all the candidates. I remember when I was a candidate. Mm -hmm. He does all the candidate. He uh, used to. Yeah. But he, was, he, was the bi he filled the bilingual clerk position, though? Is that? No, no, no. 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 These the are other, two different the, things. This other okay. position. Two different positions. It was a vacant position. So he was in a clerical position, but was essentially doing things that were beyond clerical. Just, just 
Well, everybody in this apartment does that. And that's how come we've been slowly working through uh, the processes of HR to get individuals classified into the position of the job that they're doing. And are we only able to do that when somebody leaves or we can do that when somebody's in the job? Uh, does anybody want to jump in it's on that? It's much <laughs> more difficult to get a position reclassified when there is a person in that position than it is when the position is taken. Right. Actually, we went through this uh, with someone in IT some years ago, if, if you recall, trying right. to. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I, I, I recall learning about it afterwards. But, yeah, um, yeah. And no. I guess part of my question is, is that um, if we have people who are doing the more than than clerical, it would seem that one, and, it, and if they're doing a good job, it would seem that an important retention measure would be to get them a, a, a position that matches their skills rather than one that's below their skills. Um, and even though, and believe me, I'm in my other job, I'm very familiar with some of the difficulties of um, HR issues. Um, but um, I'm just wondering whether, um, rather than doing it a bit at a time, if it makes sense to, you know, if there are more of these to do, uh, if it makes sense to try and do more of them before we lose people. We well, have a high retention rate, so we're not losing people because, uh, because the county is a very good location to work. We have been doing that. We have employed the employees have worked very hard at trying to meet the requirements to get their positions reclassified and have performed all of the steps that's required by human resources and they've been denied. <coughs> and to continue to ask them to jump through all these hoops and be denied continuously is also demoralizing. Oh, sure. So, Allison uh, works with HR very, very closely, and any time that we see an opportunity to try to get someone reclassified, we attempt to get that person reclassified into the position that, at the jobs level that they're doing. And we will continue to do that, and that's what I've been doing since I arrived here. Do they give you a reason? When they deny Yes, they do. They give us a long so written reason. Um, let me sense? ask you, is there, um, you is there any sense in, in uh, the board uh, uh, reaching out uh, to have a review of the entire <laughs> agency and positions? <laughs> and, um, and, you know... You know, the position of the county is that the employees are all civil service and merit system and report directly to the county executive. Yeah. So you certainly could send the letter to the county executive, but that that is not generally the purview of the board. Well, it sounds like it might, well, might help and probably wouldn't hurt if it were done on a general basis, not a specific person basis. Yeah, right. You, you mean, know. are you talking about a review of the classification of the review of the classifications yeah. across the board well, here. You, that the, it seems right. it's uh, been, what I'm hearing is that everything has been, you know, compressed at the bottom end for a long time. And it's and it's very right. difficult to, you know, individually be be moving people up. We we've, we've been. I mean, I suppose they might. I want to also make sure that you understand that even if a person becomes reclassified. That does not mean that the salary goes up. That's correct. And that's another piece of the pie that people don't always understand. Is the union involved? But could it, yes. in, could it in time? Yes, involved. Sure. Could the salary go? I mean, they have a, a, a chance of... 20 would, years out. It would, put to, it would move them. If a position is reclassified, it moves them into that classification, obviously, which is almost always a different grade than the position that sure. they were previously in. By moving them into that higher grade, if they are currently being paid a salary which is within that new grade, they would see no money. 
However, as step increases yes, occur, of course. Their, their salary would go up. And their upside potential. And their yeah, upside yeah. potential yeah. Would, would be there. Um, the only time that someone would see money coming from a reclassification immediately would be if you were reclassified to a grade that was higher paid than your salary, yes. and then they would have to bounce you up to the lowest amount of the new grade. When someone gets, when someone's position gets reclassified, who where there's an incumbent in the position, they're able to move to the new position without competition. Yes. Okay. So so reclassifying their position would not have that negative effect on them that they'd have to compete for their own job. No, they would okay. not have to compete for okay. their, okay. their position. If they're okay. part of the reclass, if they are an individual, such as when we had them reclassified, uh, successfully were able to reclassify from PAAs to OSC positions or office service clerical positions, all of the individuals did not have to reapply for their position. Right. They just automatically were moved into that uh, clerical position. Is there a grievance process if someone's working? And yes. And, and, and the, the and GO the, handles and that? The union is well aware of the, okay. this as an issue. Uh, we're not the only agency that has this issue. Recreation also has this issue. Okay. Did you want to add anything, Allison? No, no, I'm, I mean, I guess the reason I'm sitting down here at the end of the table making faces is because different employee situations differ, and I'm not sure what's appropriate for us to get into in a public forum or what would require, you know, either a um, uh, uh, executive, meeting. executive session or just offline conversations <coughs> about what, I, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, which employee or employee situations would be prompting the line of questioning, and then those individual situations may differ. We're, we're so not, I, I, I can know. speak for myself. I'm not being yeah. prompted by any particular employee situation. I'm prompted by what I just heard at the table. Oh, okay. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not okay. trying to, I don't know what people's grades are. I'm not trying to, no, to, I, to, I'm not trying to do anything for a specific individual. I just know what, from comparable experience, right. that having someone who is, um, graded it below the level of what their work is um, can be problematic on many fronts and and we need people to do that um, you know the higher level work um, and and if people are doing the higher level work they should be appropriately compensated for it yeah and recognized for it uh, in, in light of that uh, the discussion and uh, uh, I'd like to make a motion that uh, we uh, prepare a letter to go to the uh, county executive. Uh, I'll be happy to work with whomever uh, uh, on it and um, raising the issue and, and requesting um, a review. I'll second that. Um, you know, I don't think it can hurt anything. And, Would it be you know, helpful? Well, do we, have, do we have enough information as to what we're asking for? Sure. I don't really know what you're asking for specifically. We're, we're asking for a review of positions in terms of their classification and that there has been a history of uh, the positions being classified at a lower level than in fact the work entails and uh, at I would like to point out that there have been a number of employees that have had a review of their classification in the last 24 months, and they were all denied. Uh, well, I think that can be uh, that that can be a part of it as well. I mean, you know, let me ask in, in light of that. Let me ask another question. And so, how many? A number of employees. You said uh, all of those employees are classified below the level of their work, the skill level that they need to do the job? I'm not really comfortable answering that question in this session. Um. All right. So I would say no. But you certainly can send, you know, you can certainly prepare a letter. You can work with Allison, and Allison can help you prepare the letter. 
Uh, Mr. President, let me say this. I think it would be probably helpful before we sent such a letter to maybe get a sense from Margaret or, or the staff here about they I'm probably thinking. know more about you know Our classifications and how pervasive it, uh, an issue it is. Maybe we should solicit some more input before in an executive session. Well, this I this this started with uh, a description of how yes. we no, as I an agency have suffered from from right. this. But I was thinking these. about maybe an ex I'm hearing that perhaps we need an executive session to have some detailed discussion of how many it is. Just, just get a little more information so we can send a more specific letter if we choose to well, do that. Well, I, I would think that job classifications are not private. Um, if if we wanted to talk about specific individuals and you know uh, jobs that might that might be different, I personally am a little concerned over the idea of trying to make this case based on specific individuals because obviously we're only exposed to a limited. We're not talking of, about individuals, of, of, we're talking about jobs. Right, but then if we're talking about jobs, I'm not quite sure what the basis is for the executive session. I mean, because their job... Because they've said the several job, times they won't, don't want to discuss this publicly. Well, not to so discuss it publicly is not sufficient. <laughs> in my order experience to cover, has been this. You know. Maybe, if, maybe this will help, and I, um, I, I think I can phrase this in a way that I can say in a public session. The, um, my experience has been that there is, first of all, there is a process where any permanent um, employee, um, not remembering, I think it's just limited to the union positions, can request a reclass, it's not requested, it's not limited to the union positions, uh, can request a reclassification on an annual cycle. There's something called a June box. Um, from year to year, it has varied. Employees can ah. request of the Office of Human Resources a, a reclassification of their position. The number of positions that have, in fact, been evaluated has varied from year to year. How many of those requests the Office of Human Resources accepts has varied from year to year. Sometimes that um, review is done internally by the Office of Human Resources. Sometimes it is sent outside to a, a consulting firm that effectively does the evaluation and compares what the employee provides with the position description and, and looks into it. Um, the, um, in addition, um, there are a variety of ways where um, Margaret can request a position to be looked at. Um, what I have seen that I believe is generally the case, although this may vary from year to year depending on the budget or you know, certain situations, is that that is not a no cost thing. There is a cost to the department to have a position evaluated. Um, I don't know what the cost would be for the department to have the Office of Human Resources look into every position in the department, um, but I suspect that that would not be a no-cost effort. That's correct. And, and Allison, right now reclassification That's could crazy. occur in one of two ways, if the employee herself requested or if Margaret were to request it? Yes. Um, if I may, there's also a third way, um, and that is periodically um, the Office of Human Resources will select specific classifications and determine that a review of that entire class, so everyone in the county with that classification would then be grouped together and a review of that class would occur and then there might be a change county-wide for a class. So that is the third way that happens. It's originated from HR, and I don't know what their formula is for determining. I mean, I went through one last Each year. Each year they pick, yeah, yeah, they pick something. And, and, and so they, they randomly pick them and, and do them. And I think that's what generated the PAA to the OSC last year was that that was a, wasn't that a, well, I don't know. I don't want to go any further. No. <laughs> so did I, am I hearing correctly? Some of these, when you say a great many in the last year or so, some of these were generated by the employees and some were generated by you. I, I'm just not sure how much we, I mean, is that a personnel matter that we can even get into in a public session? Well, I mean, generically, the positions. Generically, you can, you can yeah, we're just speaking position. generically. Well, generically speaking, um, what I would suggest is that um, if you wish to, the June box is coming up, so um, yeah. what I would suggest is that we could provide you the various classifications of, that we have in the department and tell you the last time that HR reviewed those positions. 
because we've been doing them over the course of time. So as Margie just mentioned, the budget management and budget specialist three just they just completed that and was sent to us in January. Yeah, it was like a year and a half process. Right. So I mean, it, and it does take a long time. So we just received the budget and man management analyst review of that position, and um, there was no change. Well, the title changed. The title changed. Yeah, it seems like to have a substantive letter, we need more information, I think. Right, and Allison and Margie could probably put that together for you so that you would have it for the next board meeting. So that would also include the number of people in these various classifications? Sure, we could do that. Okay. But an evaluation, I guess, necessarily has to take account of tasks that the individual in question is <coughs> doing in that job, which someone else with the same classification in another agency may not be doing, right? That's correct. Uh, well, uh, let me revise my motion then to uh, say that... Let me withdraw my second so You didn't just, second it, I did. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, uh, we would like uh, additional information as discussed uh, on uh, job classifications in a generic uh, way, not, not dealing with any specific individuals, but looking at specific classifications, if you will, uh, to learn more about the history uh, of the review uh, that has, has been done in this area, uh, and pending, pending the outcome uh, of that information uh, by the board, uh, will determine um, further next uh, steps. Do we need a motion for can, that? Can we can we specify that it's at the April meeting? Do we need a motion for this? We just uh, uh, well, yeah, because we, we we want it we want in it time right, certain. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so that the, so that by the April meeting we can we can have you know a discussion on this and see if we move forward because we are up against this June date as it turns out now with the June box. So and so you're asking the Margaret to do that, not a letter at this point. Right. You would, okay. That's yeah. right. So, so a uh, list of. A list of current classifications mm -hmm. in the department, yeah, so what? how many individuals are in those, and when the last time was that they were submitted for reclassification. And what the result was. And the result, and yes. The result. And not just simply denied or affirmed or whatnot, with, with a little bit of a description why, why it was denied. On uh, a generic basis. I, we're, they we're might not we always just, say why. I, I think probably the best thing to do would be for us to take this request and try to put together a memo and run it past Kevin. I just, I want to make sure that I'm not, you know, because a lot of these requests are not necessarily initiated by us, but by the employees, and I just don't know. About privacy you know, and all that it, kind I mean, of stuff. if somebody requests a reclassification and is denied, is that something that is, you know, Right, right. I mean, employees. I understand. And you may want to include, when you speak to HR, <coughs> what the county's policy is for doing a county-wide review of its classifications because they probably do retain Hendrix or some other consulting firm on a routine basis that does reviews of classifications. So how they decide who they review and right. what it would involve if the department were to ask for a review at the department's cost. Do we have a policy on how we decide who we review like the one that was described today? It was vacant. Okay, so I mean, basically it's based on the, on the vacancy. Correct. But some of these, as you said, take a long time, but I presume since you want to fill the position, uh, this would be on some expedited basis that they'll, they'll review this, this reclassification of this position? It's done. Oh, it has been done. Yeah, the year and a half has gone by, and they they reclassified. They agreed. They didn't. They didn't agree 100% with us, but they agreed mostly with us. 
question. So we now have a program specialist position in operations that will eventually be soon. All right, so okay. we have a second. Did you second yeah. that one? Yes. 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 Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. aye. No one opposed? Did you vote that? Jackie, yes. Vote? Oh, Just aye. Okay. And that's for April. Correct. Thanks. Great. Okay. Budget, Margie. Uh, okay. Um, you received in, advance, in the advance packet a copy of the latest spreadsheet um, showing where we are at. Uh, according to these figures, we have about 27% uh, of our budget left um, for the rest of the fiscal year. We are just about at um, the fourth quarter, so tracking fairly well. Um, I would um, certainly answer any questions anybody might have on anything specific. Aren't you had a question? Uh, o over time, it looks like we're a good deal over <laughs> what the budget was, but I guess that's because of everything yeah. that happened in the general election. Yeah, and we did have a discussion about this um, at, at last month's meeting. We are not, if you look historically at how much we spend in overtime, we're right on track. Um, we have requested every year um, for the Office of Management and Budget to increase our overtime budget because we are spending more than what they're giving us and they continue to give us the same $249,000. So while yes, we are significantly over what was allocated to us, we are not at all over um, what we historically have spent in overtime. Meaning and over the last five Over years? the last yeah. several years yeah. and given the fact certainly that we implemented an entirely new system which brought its own challenges. The fact that we've kept the overtime to what it has historically been. I don't see any issue with this at all. Do you think overtime will be lower in um, a non-election year fiscal year like 2018? There are no non-election yeah. fiscal years anymore because of the timing of the election. Yeah, yeah. So the right. FY18 budget would have the gubernatorial general in it. The FY17 has the gubernatorial primary in it right. by about four days. Right. So, <laughs> right. Um, so we do have an election every fiscal year at this point, so we don't see a real fluctuation in that anymore. Right, right, okay. Have we replaced the cane movers? That's is that a state. Um, is that state? That's Not us? state and... Uh, I'm going to talk about that in the state. Okay. okay. It's coming. Okay. <laughs> How many more bills are we expecting from the state? Because I see the number of the yellow lines are at roughly half. Sure. Well, we've received yeah. the first and second quarter invoices from them, so we'll mm -hmm. still receive the third and fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. Typically, those invoices um, for the quarter ending March 31st, um, we would see an invoice probably by the end of April. Mm -hmm. And likewise, for the June 30th uh, end of fiscal year, we would see um, an invoice. Uh, they try to get that one to me by the middle of July so that I can pay it. Um, but any any remaining funds, as has been our our historical way of doing things, any remaining funds in those after the third quarter invoice will be encumbered. So that if we don't get um, the invoice until after uh, the cutoff for paying bills, we'll still have the money available. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, there's no other questions on FY17. I want to make sure that the board members are aware that the FY18 uh, operating budget, we will be going before the Government Operations Committee of the County Council. They have us currently, and we all know this is always subject to change, currently we're on the agenda for Friday, April 21st, um, the 9.30 session on the third floor council conference room. Uh, we are first at this point at the 930 agenda. So um, obviously, you know, as we see changes on that, we'll certainly make sure that everybody gets that information. Uh, Margie? Yes, Where, what line item on the budget is uh, my favorite outreach uh, item? Well, it depends on what you're talking about in terms of outreach. If you're talking about the uh, additional outreach funding that we've received from the County Council, that's included in 
the temporary uh, in the part-time salary line item because that was simply for temporary employees to assist with outreach events. Um, if you're talking about the paid advertising, um, that's at the bottom, um, 64304, uh, advertising, marketing, and sales. And that's what they did not give us any money for, but we reallo we reallocated some, some funds from other line items to increase that. So why is this indicating that we've used it all? We have. We did. We, we, we came. We did use it all. Okay. Okay. So uh, for, for we had we had election. Yes. Yeah. So, so the next item won't be until would be the next, June next primary. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? And at this point, um, because the county executive has transmitted the budget to the council. Um, the FY18 is also able to be discussed in open session. I know Margaret sent you all um, an email last week while I was away once we heard uh, that the county executive was recommending a slight increase um, to our FY18 budget um, to increase the election judge stipends. And so I just wanted to make sure that everybody had seen that email. And if anybody has any questions. Um, yeah, I didn't have a lot of detail on the amount. I didn't make copies to distribute, so I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just getting back within the last two hours. So I apologize. I can, um, I can make copies of this. But um, essentially, the increase um, was in the amount of $86,475. And that was to increase, um, I'll read it to you, but then I will go and make a copy so that you all don't have to be trying to write this down as I'm, uh -huh. as I'm doing it, okay? Um, increase in stipends for chief judges of $50, voting operation judges $30, opener closers $25, closers $25, roamers $50, um, consolidated judges, those that are in the consolidated precincts, $25. Um, and the same held true for early voting. Um, early voting, we also increased the runners, $25. And line manager, $25. And same day voter registration judges, uh, $25. And provisional judges, $25. Uh, how how does that work when people do multiple jobs in in a polling place? Uh, people move around, you know. They're well, uh, the voting operations judge on election day is trained to move around because uh, most of the judges, unless they're really proficient in one specific thing, so. One of the changes that we implemented was the provisional judge was pretty much assigned to the table with the orange tablecloth. Uh, the voting operations judge is trained on how to do the poll book and then they're supposed to assist um, and then they're supposed to be rotated to uh, the ballot issuance tables and the person who escorts to the voting booth and then the scanner. On election, I'm sorry, early voting, the judge that is doing same-day voter registration is trained specifically for Trust that, for that? One okay. location, for that one job. Um, and it, uh, then the provisional judge is doing the same thing. Um, and then the voting operations judge are uh, people that can be moved around. So even though we have 12, you know, anywhere from 8 to 12 check-in stations, they can an individual can be a check-in judge, or they can go to the table and tear the ballots apart, or they can escort individuals, or they can stand by the scanner and show them what to do. And they all are paid at the same rate, yes. those various positions. Because I'm a little surprised the chief that chief judges they are the ones that received 50, the... Um, the voting ops judges received 30, um, consolidated judges received 50, and the chief judge, yeah, 50, yeah, the rest, and the early voting, the, they were 25. 
Uh, did we recommend uh, those amounts, or <clears throat> what we we did was we pulled together a uh, analysis of all of what uh, all the other counties were paying to show how far below we were in comparison, yeah. particularly with our peers, Prince George's, Howard, Frederick, Baltimore County, and Baltimore City, and. Um, and, sh and showed the county executive, you know, why we believe that between the top since the last raise and what our peers were paying, you know, it was time to get these individuals a boost. And uh, when we uh, had the county executive, uh, the few minutes that we get with him, um, you know, he w he was interested. He wanted to yep. know why the roamers got a little bit more, and we explained that they had to drive and they had to know the technical piece besides knowing all the procedural mm -hmm. pieces. So, um, you know, we're, we're quite pleased. I mean, they, we had to, yeah, I was very pleased with the, yeah. the fact that they gave us. No, I think it's great news. Yeah, that's uh, that good. He was receptive to that. Any other questions on the budget? No. Yes. <clears throat> okay, uh, going on to the next topic, which is uh, voter registration. Jessica, um, do you want to talk? About, we have Eric and uh, mm -hmm. empty voter software upgrade. Yes, yeah, so we've had about, we have 663,000 active pending voters as of today. We have um, been working through the NCOA move changes that we get from the post office to the state and through the Eric comparison with other states. So we've um, sent confirmation cards, since about 10,000 since the last board meeting, to voters that we've received information that they possibly moved to try to do our list maintenance and get things up to date. We still have about 15,000 files to go through. We've already gone through about 30,000, so we'll continue this on uh, for the rest of the month. And then uh, we are getting an update to the system. We're having a webinar later this week. They're going to update um, some of the processing of these move and the correspondence the system produces. Because of our bilingual, there's always a little bit of challenges with the way the information prints out. So, can you can update the changes. Jessica, the 10,000 you sent out, are those people that you think have moved out of state? Those are, um, those are out of state moves um, because in state moves, because Maryland is considered in a jurisdiction within the entire state, not within a county, then we can process those move notifications within the state and we don't have to send separate confirmation. We do send them a notification so in case that gets returned then we can continue to see if we can find them. But the confirmation of this is our, um, those 10,000 are all out of state. And then uh, what happens, you get some, presumably some number back from people but not everyone's going to respond. So how do you, Correct. Do you what else do you do to verify that, because uh, I think if you're convinced that they moved away then they need to be taken off the rolls. Right? So what the um, process is, um, according to in the RA is that we send them a confirmation. It, um, they have two weeks to respond. If they do not respond, they become inactive. And inactive voters um, stay on the rolls from the date of the confirmation through the next two federal elections. And if they do not vote in the next two federal general elections, then they can be removed to that point. But they do go into that inactive. How long does it take you to remove them if they haven't voted in the second one, if they're the second federal? Well, we did a process after the last um, presidential general election. And how long does that process take? It only took, I mean, we could do it as soon as the elections reopen and everything's cleared off. We don't have to do any further correspondence or follow-up. It's how, done electronically. Yeah, it's done electronically. How, how do you initially determine to send out the confirmation? There's something that convinces you that someone has moved. So the, uh, the federal law allows, if we get a return piece of mail, if we send something to a voter and it gets returned to us by non forwardable mail, that's what we use our sample ballot is our federal mailing. We can also use the NCOA, National Change of Address, from the post office that indicates a move of a voter who has submitted that information to the post office. We can use that also in the confirmation process. And then we can also use notification from other jurisdictions, which is where the error comes in. That's a project um, where, you know, multiple states come together and compile the information. It's ran through this giant supercomputer, um, and then each state receives a list of their voters who are registered in other states to vote. 
And then if you get that confirmation, you don't need to hear back from the person. No, right? we, we still send a confirmation in all of those cases. Um, the only time a voter is removed from the list um, and not put into the active is if we receive confirmation from that voter and their signature stating, yes, I have in fact moved. Please remove So even if Eric indicates they've registered in another state, <coughs> and your policy is that you don't think the law permits you to remove the voter unless... We still you undergo know. the confirmation process. Yeah. Now, yeah, if the voter... Sense. Yeah. If the voter does register in the other state and they notify at the bottom of their registration that they were previously registered in Maryland and we received that from that state, we can use that. And it's all done electronically quickly? That's my question. It has to go to the here, the state, Eric, et cetera, various And then places. those lists all come back to us and we process them for every voter by hand. What I was responding to is the two, if an individual has, we've sent the confirmation mailing, probably at least two times, if not more than that. Um, and they have not voted in two federal elections, which is the general election. And it, then and that record is shown. Then Janet uh, Ross, working with the state IT, will uh, decide on a specific day, what day the cancellations are going to occur. And they will uh, cancel those number, that number of voters that meet that criteria. So in the past, um, the last, last time it was what, 11,000? 15,000. 15, so if you were to look at our statistics from January 1 of this year to February 1, you would see a drop of approximately 15,000. So we're talking about three, two, two to three months after the general election. Well, the purge takes keep, place. Well, the January. It, it always occurs in January. Thank you. I just get these questions. I'm answering questions. And I have another question. And uh, I understand today in the paper, it talked about Frederick County had asked the uh, whatever the county jury system is under. What would that be? The, the jury commissioner? All right. Ask the jury commissioner to give them the names of all of the jurors that had been taken off of being jury duty because they were registered in the motor vehicles but were not citizens. And they got something like 1,800 names of people that had not been allowed to go on jury duty and checked them against their files of who had voted in Frederick County and found that 180 people had voted that had not been allowed to be on jury duty because they weren't uh, citizens. Uh, I'm a little... I I don't know, it's interesting that you bring this up because we get a list quarterly of yep. individuals who have stated they are non-citizens <coughs> and then the court system sends that to the state and the state sends that to us. And does, does under the, all right, the people that have self-said yes. they're not citizens. Uh, one would only assume that this was people that didn't do that, the jury, and when looking them up, the, the commissioner found out that they were not citizens well, and they hadn't had voted. I mean, I, I did not, not read the not, article. I've unusual. been getting several telephone calls this morning about it. It's not unusual for people to get their jury notice and say that they are not a citizen and or they are no longer right. in that jurisdiction. Because they don't want to serve, the you, you mean? Serve right. as a, as well, a but juror. that's so, not what any of this is. Well, this is checking against that list, but every couple of months the, the boards get a list of those individuals who should be removed based upon the fact that they're not able to serve, do their jury service. So let me give you an example. There was an individual this last election cycle who wanted an absentee ballot and she said she's a resident of Maryland and she has submitted something to the jury commissioner four years ago saying that she had moved to New York and was no longer eligible to go ahead and serve in Montgomery County as a juror. But she likes, she likes voting in Maryland. But she <laughs> live in Maryland. Not willing to go ahead and do jury service in Maryland. <laughs> so she perjured she herself removed. before the jury commissioner, right. or was she about to perjure herself before yeah. the board of elections? So huh? that, <laughs> that list is developed, I mean, and there are people that show up for jury service, and when they give reasons that would disqualify them from being a voter, do they, that information is transmitted. Do the jury people, the people that look up people, mm -hmm. look at everybody's citizenship 
No. Oh, no. But, so but to so serve everybody would have to be self-proclaimed, not a... Correct. Not a citizen? Correct. Because, uh, Jackie, the hmm. juror uh, lists in, in courts in Maryland are drawn from the DMV. I understand that. That's my point All to this whole thing, yeah. is that they... But you have to be a U.S. citizen to serve as a juror. You have exactly. To, and then you have to fill out a qualification form. I get that. Okay. What I'm suggesting is that there are some people who voted who we're not served as jurors, do we do anything t to check that out? Do we have any way of getting the w lists they did in Frederick? Well, if, if there's someone who goes to the juror commissioner, calls up and says, I'm not a U.S. citizen, I, I'm not eligible to serve, or they, they show up and they fill out the questionnaire on the day they're doing their jury duty, and they say, I'm not a U.S. citizen, that juror commissioner then generates a list that ultimately makes its way to the Board of Elections that renders those people ineligible. And they do it in every county in the state? Yes. Well, I'll have to, we'll have to look and see what Frederick is talking about then because the article said they found 180 people that voted through this jury list that were and allowed can, to vote. And one other point, we do get people on the list from the juror commission that say that they're not citizens and we send them a letter that states we received this from the jury commission, you stated you weren't a citizen. And they will call us and they will say, that was six months ago I did that, and I became naturalized two months ago, and that's when I registered to vote. So I am a citizen, and I am eligible to be a voter now. So there are, it's kind of a shifting thing, because there's, you know, with the amount of um, naturalized citizens in this area, kind of is evolving. The other thing is, is that when the person is filling out the qualifications form, Sometimes they mark it incorrectly. So, oh, just 180 yeah. voters in Frederick County mm -hmm. sounded like a whole lot. And it came from that specific, according to the article in the Times, it came from that specific place. Well, I will tell you that we receive a list. I, I don't know if it's quarterly or every, every six months, but we do receive a list from the court system that informs us who has declared themselves as non-citizens and ineligible. And um, we have something that's kind of close to this, but it's going to be covered in Kevin's report. Uh, I, I, I guess I'm a, I'm a little confused in this discussion because if I heard Kevin correctly, um, there would be people claiming that they were not a citizen uh, to get out of jury duty. This is not checked before they send that list forward. Is that correct? They just send this list you get periodically that comes as people that, that said that they weren't citizens for purposes of jury duty. But it hasn't been verified in any way. Well, when you receive the jury qualification form, you're signing that under, as, as I, I just received one, and I believe that if I make a false statement, it's perjury. Am I right? You're right. I, okay. Sure. So if you make a false statement, I suppose somebody could go after those individuals. But, I mean, as long as I've been in this profession, I have had individuals. In my old county, I was the election commissioner slash jury commissioner. So, I mean, I saw it even more frequently because every Monday I had to be with the clerk of the district court you know, going through and listening to all the different rationale why someone was not, did not have time to serve as a juror. So, and, you know, that people, if they have a, if they feel they have a valid reason not to spend two weeks hanging out in the courthouse, they will come up with some very inventive reasons. And part of it is saying they're not a citizen of the United States. So then when you get that list and the people that self-verified yeah. that they weren't a citizen, that's when this triggers something gets mailed to them. Yeah, they get a you don't just automatically take them off at that no, point. So Marianne, maybe I can help them. The letter of oath that they get is, this office received notice from the jury commission that you are not a United States citizen. In registering to vote, you sign a note that begins under penalty of perjury. I hereby swear, swear or affirm I am a U.S. citizen. The information received from the jury commission indicates you've stated otherwise, and then gives them notification that 
they have basically a two-week period to go ahead and correct whatever the situation is. And when they correct it, that's when you get notified, like you did the people who became citizens later. Or they or there was error. check the wrong box. What, what do, they, do, they, do they respond in writing? I mean, do they, or they call Francis, or they show up at the front. Right, okay. But, I mean, yeah. but we don't just accept people on the phone. But, so I was going to say, the follow-up is, if you yeah. don't hear from them in two weeks. They can't, they're canceled. They what? They're canceled. They're removed completely. Oh, All right, you take them off. You take immediately. You take them off. Right. You don't send sheriff to their home or anything. Okay. Does a jury follow up? I mean, the jury commissioner follow up and do anything? I don't, I don't know. You don't I don't know, know what the jury commissioner. Do we uh, not notify the jury commissioner that we got something from them saying they're not a citizen? Usually, there's conversation between both, especially if it's a discrepancy. That sometimes the jury commissioner directly contacts us and says that the person contacted them because that's the person they transacted the paperwork with. And so they... Do people usually say what the mistake was? Do you All the time. And they say it was... Well, the box that says that you're um, over the age that you're required to serve is right next to it. So that's the most common mistake, is that somebody checks the box that says that they're not a citizen and they meant to check the box saying that they're not required to serve. So usually that's what happens, and they'll come <laughs> in and they'll have their ID and they'll be like, I'm a citizen, I promise, I'm just, I don't have to serve. The other is they'll show up with naturalization paperwork or other documentation showing that they, Thank have, you. you know, they are eligible. And I did look up the article you were referencing, and it was a result of a court or a court. Um, they were sued by a group requesting records from both the jury commission and from Frederick County, and it was from 2007, 8, and 11. They found 180 non-citizens had registered to vote, and of those, 63 had voted over the period since then to now. So it may have been errors, mistakes, not corrected, or who, I mean, you know, 63 over the last 10 years is what they came and trying to verify whether or not, and we do have people that we cancel, they never okay. respond to a letter, and they show up later to register, and, you know, we talk to them because the record indicates that's why they were canceled, and often they're mistakes, but they never remedy them, maybe they've moved, I mean, various things happen. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, what, okay. quick, what, one quick thing. Jessica says we have 663,000 active registered voters. You, you guys have told me before, because I do a lot of speaking engagements and clubs and things, don't we have a big chunk of uh, inactive registered voters, like 50,000, 40,000? Yeah. So what number should I use when I say, how, how people say, well, how many registered voters do you have? Uh, should I use? Official, mm -hmm. According to Maryland, the official count is active and pending, which is what I just provided you. So for official purposes, well, yeah, but, I, I don't know. It's a metaphysical I, question. Here's the thing: <laughs> if we were to do a petition right. drive, then the it would be active and pending and inactive. It's too comp. If someone asked me how many registered voters in Montgomery County, what's the answer? I go with what Kevin says. Roughly over 700,000. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to throw in the... Uh, more more, I, I, more than six the, states, yeah, reason, right? The reason, yes. The reason why I say this, Maryland law makes no distinction between active and inactive. I know. And I, so, so really, if you're looking for the number of how many people can actually cast yes. a vote in, a, in an election, it's 710,000. Yeah, we were over... Numbers yeah. Are. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, any more questions? About voter registration. No, but that's also, I mean, that's a number that fluctuates. It's fluctuating somewhat less between Eric and all of these things that are, but I mean, that's a number that's fluctuating and it's going to go down basically in the off year and then back up in the election year in terms of the number of active as people update their registrations, right? Normally. Well, and we did just okay. first, so. Yeah. All right. Um, State Board of Elections. Uh, the draft MOU between Montgomery County mm -hmm. Board of Elections and the City of Tacoma Park. We have a draft. It was submitted for review uh, by the State Board of Elections because they have to sign off on it. Um, I did speak to the State Board staff. They have acknowledged they've received it, but they also acknowledge they have not read it. And so um, we're waiting on their response and what their expectations are in terms of uh, what kind of backup or service support they're going to give to the city of Tacoma Park. 
Um, the biennial is scheduled for October 23rd in Annapolis at the Doubletree Conference Event Center. The meeting is mandatory for the board members, board attorney, director, and deputy director. September 23rd. When, when is October, it? October, 23rd. October 23rd. If I said September, I'm sorry. That's Annapolis. And in Annapolis, yes. this is an all-day event, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and the topics are going to be determined after the close of the session. So it's a one-day event? Yes, it's a one-day event. Does that mean, vis-a-vis -vis our earlier discussion and the state board meeting that we were <coughs> last in attendance at, where they were still hoping, they being the state board, were still hoping to get funding that would allow them to have this meeting in conjunction with uh, the Mayo uh, meeting? The, no, they did not receive funding. This is the only meeting that they will be having on October 23rd. And that's a, that's a result of, 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 of a funding issue. I mean, otherwise I so. it would, yeah. Okay. Okay, then uh, Linda Lamone advised the election directors to monitor House, I think it's Senate Bill 406. Is it Senate Bill or House Bill? Senate Bill. Senate Bill 406, I'm sorry. Uh, regarding the opportunity to request additional scanners for 2018, um, the proposed measure does state that the elections uh, officials need to get uh, the local county executive and county council or county commissioners to support the request for additional scanners for the upcoming election cycle. Just support, they don't need the monetary I think that's what support Comment. means. Support means money. Okay. Okay. I think the legislation says that it's a 50-50 split. It's a 50, yeah. like right. everything else. Right. Okay, um, then once the session is final, their request will go before the Board of Public Works for an addendum to the current contract. Could, could I ask a question about that? Mm -hmm. the, the legislation says um, that, it's, that, the that, that we have to submit our request including the county's approval a year in advance um, our election is going to be just shy of a year after the bill takes effect because it takes effect July 1 so um, Linda's position is there is flexibility but um, realistically we, have we to need to make the request now as soon as the session right. adjourns right. this thing is passed and the right. governor puts his signature on it, if he does, then we're, I'm recommending that a letter be drafted and we send it over saying we want uh, 158 uh, scanners so that we can have two scanners in every precinct like we did in the fall. All right. Okay, e thank you. Um, ES&S and the State Board staff will brief the directors on the updates the software for the voting equipment maintenance requirements, training, um, the mock election date uh, planning. A mock election will be mid-January and they're going to be doing planning sessions uh, over the late summer and part of September. The issue of the number of candidates that can be viewed on the ballot marking device is now 14 names instead of seven uh -huh. on one screen. So that issue has been resolved. Um, general discussion occurred with regards to the ballot marking device for early voting for 2018. Um, we are getting some electrical information as well as um, uh, what, how many of these units we can daisy chain together. Inventory planning and deadlines for the Maryland Department of General Services for the State Board of Elections was also discussed and what deadlines we need to help the state comply with. The RFP for the moving services is still in development with the Maryland State Board of Elections staff. That's how come you did not receive a copy of the RFP. Um, there are some new issues that have come to light and so they are working on it. Um, and once we know that they have an RFP out there, <coughs> we will share it with the board members. Uh, does every county have to use the same uh no, the, no. the impact of the loss of office movers, well, first of all, there is a renewal contract with the other movers, but uh, office, the loss of office movers 
um, is significant for our county and Prince George's County. And there's probably some other counties that I'm not aware of. And so everyone is deeply concerned about this. Um, so they are trying to get the RFP ready to go uh, so that they can get a broad range of individual companies to um, bid on that contract. But they, but it's going through the state. It's not, we won't have charge of our own, so to speak. Uh, in selection. The lease with ES and S requires that the state be in charge of the delivery of the equipment and there's certain insurance and bonding requirements that go with the movement of moving this equipment. Okay. For what it's worth. Um, electronic poll books will have updated software and all the batteries will be replaced again. And then uh, we also have the summary guide for Maryland candidacy and campaign finance laws is available electronically. And if you want a copy of that, um, please let me know and I'll send you the link to that. And uh, that's pretty much it with regards to the state board at this time. Uh, they're monitoring legislation um, and that's their big focus right now. Yes. Um, you mentioned that the ballot marking device issue, we now can have 14 names on a page instead of seven. Um, I think that there's at least the possibility of one race in 2018, uh, if not more, where we may have more than 14 people <laughs> running. Um, and I guess my question is, do we have the same issue that we had before? If, if 15 people run for county council at large, for example, um, you know, um, are we in the same place that we were before, or is there some other solution that is out there? I I think that's one of the things that's being you know reviewed and looked at, um, and I think what's going to um, at this point there's just a lot of discussion going on. There's also um, uh, you know going back to using paper. But to do that, right. you need to understand that there are 75 different, 66 to <laughs> right, well, 75 right. ballot styles, and that does increase the probability that incorrect ballots are going to be handed and, out. And, and that's the reason for my question, is because um, I'm sure that it's true for the, for the vast majority of races, 14 names is plenty. But for that one, um, um, I keep hearing, and I'm sure others hear more than I do, about more people who are thinking <laughs> about it. And uh, the possibility of having more than 14, I think, is not zero. Well, and yeah. the uh, and the big issue that yeah. ties into this, I think, David, is uh, the problem. Of course, people wanted their name listed with everybody else and not on the next page. But it was also the the fact that you couldn't use yeah. the system, uh, you couldn't Go back toggle and back and forth with right. any ease, and right. it you know had to start over, and pe it was all very messed up. So I mean that is sort of primary what needs to be corrected with this. It seems to me. Um, and, and that software, I mean, quite honestly, um, there was a gen like I said, there was general discussion about. Uh, the various aspects of the ballot marking device and once um, you know the big message was that you could see 14 or 16 names on the screen but I'm going to say 14 um, and the toggling back and forth was not addressed as much as how many for that how many names could be on uh, the screen so I think once the EAC certifies ESNS's current ballot marking device that we may or may not use for uh, the upcoming election cycle, then um, I can answer that question better. And once we get a copy of the software and we can upgrade a ballot marking device so that you all can see it, maybe that will help. At that point, will it be too late to, yeah, to, that's make, to make fixes to it? Because, I mean, it sounds like, for the reason you said, it's really important to us that we not end up in a paper situation again like we did. Uh, well, Allison and I did talk about it uh, a little bit on Friday, and one of the things that we thought we would do was 
try to talk to other jurisdictions that are currently using the ballot marking device and see what kind of user problems there were by the voters using using the old software. Mark, I don't know if I missed it. Any discussion about alleviating the duplication efforts that we do, software-wise? The duplication efforts? Yeah, in other words, no, I don't think any, so. any discussion about software to scan the internet balance? No, there was no discussion about that. So we're going to be time. duplicating again. Um, I'm not going to, I, I can't say that. They, I no, they, that. No, they, no, the RFP, aren't we going to, when are we discussing that? No, she said that there were some issues that came up with the RFP. Yeah. No, that's a different RFP, though, isn't that, it? That, uh, none of the RFPs that were supposed to go have gone yet. They, ha they haven't they have been? not gone yet. Not that, not so that we were apprised of. Now, I can double so. check with Nikki tomorrow and make sure that, but that's part of the run back. Um, it's not, I say run back, but anybody can bid on that. They're looking at different uh, different vendors to uh, provide that type of service to the local board. But no, no decision has been made with regards to that. That doesn't mean that the state isn't trying to find a vendor that can do that. They're, they're well aware that Montgomery County is not interested at all in duplicating another 21,000 ballots. Well, but she testified at a hearing uh, uh, over a month ago that they had an RFP that was... It was not discussed at the election director's meeting. ...going forward. And she told me... She told me. <laughs> this was who? Uh, at the last state board meeting that it was... Uh, uh, when's the next state board meeting? It, is it next week? Yeah. Ne uh, next week, yeah, end of the month. Careful. Pardon me? And um, I also had a question, if I may, on the poll books. Um, updating software, replacing batteries, this means they are not going to purchase new poll books, I take it? That's correct. Well, didn't they say they were going to at that meeting? Well, they wanted to. I don't think I ever heard that it was a I, done deal. I, I don't know. Obviously, it wasn't. I thought that... That was a done deal. Okay, it's obviously no. it wasn't. Getting the batteries instead. No, that there was have new software. Holders. We're getting new software, and we have to replace all the batteries. And um, I did express my concern about the poll books and their ability to work with the same-day voter registration software. That. Um, you know, it was not a great system. Did we have new batteries for the last election? When did we last replace the batteries, Janet? Was it two years ago? Yes. Oh, two years ago. Because in the last election, remember, they were going down at early voting just a, every day, every that night. That was a memory issue. That wasn't electrical. It was a memory issue. Really? Um, they're old. They're what year? 2006? Yeah, they're 14 years old or something. Yeah. I thought they were being replaced. Which one does I was sure they said the that at the state board meeting. Be so they talked about replacing them. There's only so much money to do so many things. How much does it cost to replace polls? Oh, I'm sure statewide. State I but I mean, did they ask for it? I I can't imagine that she didn't. I I think they did. I mean, because I, I it, it, my uh, my impression was it was it was a done deed, but obviously it wasn't. Okay. All right. Um. Uh, Margaret, uh, I'm sorry. Just to follow up on this uh, issue with the ballot marking device, uh, how can how can we weigh in further on that or? Um, uh, I mean, I'm still concerned about how the system itself is going to work and the toggling back and forth. And it's it's not just an issue of uh, including more names per page. There were other problems with using that that system. And uh, I I would like to know if they're addressing that. Well, uh, the best thing that I can do is I can ask ES and S to come to the next board meeting 
and try to, if you all want to come here at 1.45 and uh, let ESNS show you what the new system looks like. I think that would be helpful to have them come. Or maybe, I mean, I'm sure why it has to be before the meeting. Not before yeah, the meeting. yeah, can they not just be part of the meeting? Um, we can put them on the agenda first or something. Yeah, this way yeah, but people can you come. don't get the touch and feel and won't be able to see. You won't actually be able to, with a type of presentation. The most effective way for you to determine if this thing is working the way you think it should is to touch it, feel it, play with it. I see. So, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's uh, true. So I don't mind uh, ESNS doing a presentation. If you want to do it on the back end of the meeting, that's fine. Uh, well, that's, that's difficult. It gets late sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And in that same thing, who is it that's looking into making sure we don't have to duplicate? Now, we're, we, we just spoke about that, and I'm not sure I know where that system is now that they're trying to get either the papers. Uh, where is that? I'm going to have to call Nikki and talk to her with regards to where that is. I mean, I know pretty much what David and Marianne said that Senator Maddaleno, you know, talked talked about Linda coming before his committee and that they were looking to uh, technology as a solution. And um, I believe that that's part of the overall run back uh, contract. The contract where ballots are created elsewhere. Um, so let me talk to Nikki with regards to that. That was not part of the director's discussion on Thursday, I think that was. So I can't answer. Are we the only people that are upset about the state? Yeah, pretty much. We are? On the duplication issue? Mm -hmm. I know, I That's don't what I thought. That's the impression I've got. Is anybody else upset so about it? It's zero. And oh, yeah, 21, Our volume 000. is so much bigger yeah, than... Yeah, yeah. yeah. What about 21,000? Well, if for some reason they aren't doing the RFP, it would probably be smart for them, and if not them, us, to let Senator Madeline. <laughs> let me talk to Nikki, okay? Okay. All right, do you, are you prepared to mm -hmm. talk about, is there anything else? Okay, do you want to talk about legislation now? Sure. Um, the board members were distributed a condensed list of the bills of for, um, Condensed list of the uh, same bills you pull up if you go to the elections subject on the um, General Assembly's website. Margaret and I um, narrowed it down to the bills on that list that we're moving forward. The, I have a few updates since that list you received. Um, House Bill 1626 passed the House on Saturday. Uh, 1626. Okay. Okay. And Senate Bill 406 has also passed the Senate. So House Bill 1626 is the bill to address that difference between early voting and election day about how um, about whether voters need to provide proof of residence to change their address or not. So it would make early voting like election day where you don't need to provide the proof of residence. And Senate Bill 406 is the bill that allows for us to um, for at the board's uh, request with agreement by the county's governing body to request a minimum of two scanners per polling place and then it requires the state board to provide that and put the tab for half of it. But before they'll, but they have to have the letters from the county before right. they're going to go and, okay. So each one passed one house of legislation? Correct. Each one passed the house that it was introduced in. Okay, thank you. And all of the house passed bills have now been scheduled for Senate hearing. There's a Senate hearing on Thursday at 1. Elsie, you know that bill that we uh, we, we sent a letter to uh, Cheryl Kagan about we should Election approve. Observer? We, yeah, we should approve the observers. I think that bill yeah. was withdrawn. Was it? Remember, they, the state board wanted to do the observers, and we said... Oh, I thought it was on here. We should approve it. by local boards. It was on there, um, but I... Let me check real quick. But I believe that Senate Bill 58 has been that's withdrawn. That's it. 58, that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not on here. Yeah? It's not on there because it's been withdrawn. Okay. It's been withdrawn. Okay. Good. Yeah, it's on. It was unfavorably reported committee. 
So the law is that we control it, right? It goes back to well, the law. How it's been done in the past, I guess, right? Right. The state the state technically can you know, send people, but generally speaking, I'm gonna let Margie address this because she has something in her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically, uh, in the past, we've had great cooperation with the state right. board, okay. and they notify us when they've got visitors, or, and it's generally State Department and international visitors. Right. Do you want to try? I think that was I the... I think that was very good. <laughs> <laughs> now that my mouth's empty, I'll be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> but it's like it's always been now. Yeah, I mean, they've always, um, this la as I mentioned okay, last good. month, this last election, they provided more coordination with me than they have in the past. Oh, good. But good. there yeah. is a, a cro today's crossover day, mm -hmm. and so um, I believe the state board is going to provide us a list of legislation that has tomorrow, well, we'll provide us a list okay. tomorrow of what's crossed over and so what still has life Good. left. Now, of course, as in any piece of legislation, there's always, you know, that last minute uh, push. Pull, push and something <laughs> could be pulled from the death bin. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, there's nothing else with regards to legislation. Um, board attorney. Why don't we have this separate? Um, the copy of House Bill 72 was, was provided because it was requested at the last board meeting. Uh, that's the 16-year-old? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have two things. Margaret touched upon the MOU with Tacoma Park. Let me just tell you what we've done in that regard. I asked Margaret to put together a memo of all of the things that we would need, uh, that the board would want in an MOU in terms of the separate responsibilities of Tacoma Park and State Board and Montgomery County. Uh, I asked, uh, I took that memo and sent it to this town attorney, uh, Ken Zygmunt, and asked him to do a draft MOU, which I have reviewed and made some minor edits to. Uh, but I think it covers all of the points that Margaret wanted. And so that's now been sent to the state, and we're awaiting uh, the state's comments with regard to that. But it looks like that's moving forward, and that's on track. Okay. The other issue is uh, Jim received a letter from an unhappy voter uh, that ironically had received a letter that they were not a U.S. citizen and thus were being removed from the jury list. And... Oh copied me on the letter and it basically had turned it into a Freedom of Information Act request regarding what documentation we have that would establish that he is not a U.S. citizen. He claims he is a U.S. citizen and it appears that we have received information from Prince George's County uh, that he was ineligible and was put on the ineligible list based upon non-citizenship. Um, How would Prince George's County know? Because he moved. Because he moved. He moved and from I, there. And I, moved think, from there to I think what happened, I think what happened was he lived in Prince George's County. He got a notice for jury service in Prince George's County. He either called up and said, I no longer live in Prince George's County, or he showed up to do jury service either during the questionnaire or actually when doing voir dire, like on my voir dire for all of my jury trials, I always ask, are you a citizen or a resident of whatever jurisdiction it is, whether it's Prince George's or Montgomery or Queen Anne's or whatever. And I, sometimes you do get people that stand up and go, yeah, no, I moved. I used to live in Prince George's and I live in Montgomery County now. And you're not eligible to serve as a juror in Prince George's County if that's the case. So I, I think this was a clerical administrative error. I've written to him and said we would look into it. He would not be removed until uh, it had been looked into further. Uh, and Margaret's going to send him a letter basically saying that this was uh, this was uh, some sort of administrative clerical issue and he's not going to be removed. He's a citizen? He, he vehemently affirms under the penalties of perjury that he is a U.S. citizen. Do we check that? Do we check with Social Security or whomever? To no, but we never do for anyone else when you register well, to vote. Well, what happened was 
since the time of the jury um, that the Prince George's County sent us <coughs> this uh, notice, or we received from from the State Board of Elections, from the county court system, I'm sorry, from the circuit court system, um, the gentleman went to uh, MBA and registered to vote. And he uh, was he went through that process. And when he did that, we verified his driver's license and social security number. And so he, and he signed a statement that he is a citizen of the United States on that uh, MBA form. Do we have any communication with Chris George's as to to know what happened there or are we, are we kind of um, surmising what happened there? So what happens is uh, the Prince George's Jury Commission is notified by the person that they are not eligible for whatever reason. That information is then transmitted is it transmitted to the state or is it transmitted to the county? It's transmitted to the state that then disperses it to the county and then Prince George referred it to us. That's how it works. Because he was on their list from their jury commission, but his address had already been changed at the NBA, so they knew he was now a Montgomery County voter because he had updated his registration, but he still was on the not a citizen list, so that would still be an action. So that's why it's forwarded to us. We sent him the letter. But this gentleman has a history, I mean, his history of voting goes back to what we looked at, 2000, back to 2008. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he's been a citizen and a resident of the okay. state of Maryland for a long time. And he did contact the jury coordinator in Montgomery County, because at the time we didn't know, you know, what the basis of, like, how much going in the circle this went around. And she did send an email to us saying that he had adequately <coughs> convinced her <coughs> and that he should not be removed. Yeah, I, I, I just think it was an, an error, it was yeah. an error in, the, in the clerk's okay. office in Prince George's County. Okay. So that's why it's good that these letters get sent out. So they give them two weeks to yeah. advise otherwise. That's all I have. Um, I have nothing under old business. Um, new business, the operations mm -hmm. report. So Chris is going to give her operations report. Just snuck back there, but could you get closer to the mic just yes. so we can hear you for the record? <coughs> Thank you, Janet. Um, operations is involved in several functions and Our biggest challenge for this election, and especially for the general election, was instituting the paper-based system. We had the challenge of allocation. You'll see up in the corner about over a million pieces 
of paper were, was ordered for this particular election, and then the chart shows how it was allocated throughout the uh, cycle. And I will say that we were very fortunate. Everything was allocated correctly, and we had no mistakes as far as what was sent out as far as ballot styles go for, for this election. Part of our ballot challenge is making sure that the ballot is correct. Uh, campaign finance and filing goes through lists to make sure that the names are correct. And then we have several groups, teams that go together as, um, as teams to prove. And then at the time that the proofing is complete, we forward the information on and it's put in our sample ballot as well as the ballots are printed themselves. Then, once we have our ballots printed and ready, they have to be distributed. And one of our challenges was distributing and collecting. With this uh, new system, we tried different means of collecting the ballots and the blue bins on election night. We found that in the general, our new system worked. That we had, a, had satellites, the bins were delivered out to satellites, and then the satellites loaded the trucks, our movers, brought the trucks to a staging area. Once traffic eased here at Board of Elections with returns, we started calling in trucks and they offloaded. It was a much more efficient, it was timely, and we were able to accurately count bins and account for the ballots that were in the bins. And all the bins had the voted ballots for the general election. Then once we have the ballots back in and we start going through Canvas and Audit, you will see on the table those are the backs that all were counted. There were the 482,000 backs needed to be counted and organized. Once we have gone through canvassing and the state gives us permission to open up the bins, the bins stay locked and organized until we are certified and we're assured that the election was performed as the state expected. At that point, the bins are offloaded again, and the ballots are packed. The voted ballots are packed in these boxes, put in storage in the back of the warehouse. And they are in storage for about 22 months, and then we can shred them. Next accomplishment that we felt good about, we opened all polling places on time. Part of the polling place process was to make sure that all the equipment was delivered and we can report that all of the BMDs, the scanners, and the black carts, and the uh, blue bins were delivered appropriately by the different moving organizations for the general. Then we have to go through a verification process. You help us with that towards the end of uh, packing, you take the bags as a board and you do a verification. There are several tiers of verification and how it is done is we do this in stages. You see one stage laying on the table. Once that's verified, that's packed up and put in the green bag. Then the next section or phase of the green bag goes until everything that's on that green bag checklist is packed in the green bags. Then we go on to the bags, the next color, which in this case is usually the blue bags. But you'll see once we have uh, everything packed, there's four bags for each polling place. That equates to 928 bags that were packed. Over 68,000 items were packed and ordered and counted. Now that's not pieces so to speak, because there's multiple pieces of the same items that are packed. Um, the <coughs> next slide shows 
a, a different function. This bag is packed for the roamers. There are several different bags outside of the pulling place bags that are packed. There's a roamer bag, there's a bag or a kit for our league women or gentlemen who take that out when they go out to survey the polling places. We pack carts. There are two black supply carts that are packed and moved down county at off-site locations so that roamers who do have supplies can replenish their supplies down county at one of the uh, satellite locations rather than coming all the way back up here to collect supplies on election day. We, uh, another piece that we pack is the red folder. You're familiar, familiar with that for the judges. That is packed as well. And then we look at our early voting and we continue to grow. That's this cycle for the general, the numbers for uh, the last, for the life of uh, early voting in Montgomery County. Ready for me to mm -hmm. move? Um, and then these are the same cycles on election day, reflecting the peaks. And I thank you. Thank you. Right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I choose up. This is the IT report from the presidential. First, we just, this is the steps we go through to prepare the equipment for the election. I'm not going to read it all. I'm just going to go through the highlights. For this, between the primary and the general, we have to do post-election maintenance. We have to touch every piece of equipment we have, whether we used it for the election or not, and perform a set of tests that the state provides to us. In addition, we had to do acceptance testings of the additional 158 scanners we received from ESNS to make sure they were ready for the election. And then these are the basic steps, how we allocate the equipment. And we have to format the media, all the thumb drives that go into the BMDs and the scanners, and that equals 1,246 total. We also have to label all of them. And then we had to duplicate the CF cards for the poll book, which was 1,064. Then we had to train the staff on doing the LNA procedures. And this time we had a little mishap with the state where they told us we had to change the time. And then after we got in, after we passed early voting, because early voting didn't matter, because it would be before the time change, we got into doing election day machines and the state came back and said we were wrong. You don't have to change the time. So we had to go back after we finished LNA and take, touch like 162 machines and change the time back. <laughs> and we had questioned them and we said, we didn't do it for Rockville, why are we doing it now? but they told us we had to do it, so we did it. And then we had the bulk update of the EPBs that really went really great this time. The work was just divided excellent, and everybody just performed, and we got it done in a shorter amount of time. We also, even with the mishap, finished LNA two weeks early. Okay, this is the equipment we deployed. We had 35 scanners for early voting, 20 BMDs, 115 poll books. We sent out no replacements for early voting. Even though we were getting that low memory um, mm -hmm. message, the state advised us that it was across the state. It was just the poll, the software, the amount of software they added for same day registration. And 
the amount of voters that we were having. It was running out of memory, so we were just advising them in the call center. We call out and say, every two hours, just cycle your poll books through, turn it off, let it clear out the memory, turn it back on. So that prevented a lot of it. In election day, we sent out 310 scanners, 300. No. no. That's a mistake. That's a mistake. It's 240 BMDs and 799 poll books. And we only had to send out one poll book replacement. So it was 240 BMDs. It was one for each person. Okay, and this is the accuracy rate we achieved on the um, integrity reports that go with the scanner and the BMD and the poll books. For the scanner, you have a lot of seals we have to put on. We actually improved greatly because we improved our process this time. We had a team down there that was set and monitor, and when the guys got to a certain point, we would verify the paperwork. And Margaret and Al soon also helped us with this. The closing report, we had a few issues there, but we still did better than what we did in the primary. What, what are some examples of errors? Um, like the main memory stick serial number, that's the two sticks that go in the scanner. One goes in the front and one goes in the back. Mm -hmm. On most of those, we, we mistakenly put the main in the, switched them up on the report. Instead of being the main, it was the rear. And that's what happened. So what's the difference between the number of errors and the number of issues? That's the same thing. That's issues. We just call them issues instead of Well, but I mean, you got 52 up top. Does that cover that's all everything? That's, that's everything. That's, that's, that's everything we're looking at. Mm -hmm. But the 11 at the bottom where it says closing report, that's that's the, the those are the numbers that are above it? That's the form that they have to, the judges well, need to complete. This, this number. Right. What I'm saying is that that 52 it's everything. Is, ev is, is everything. Right. For the, the scanner itself. But the 11 is for, is for just the closing. Are above it. No, but it looks like it's, I mean, does, the numbers don't add up if issues and errors are the same thing. You're right. But there are 11 issues. There's 11 at the top. In the top, in the top, in the top chart. The top, right. Yes, there are, there are 11 and issues. And then plus those down here. Right, and then if you add the bottom, you get what, 36? Right. Mm -hmm. So it's still doesn't No. How should we check the numbers for that? That's 36, yeah. Well, if we can... Yeah, I'll just fix that. Yeah, well, I'll it, fix it. It, would be, it would be useful to know, because um, obviously... Um, it's only 11 errors at the top. All right, well, we can get a corrected chart. Yeah, I'll get it right. And the BMT, that was easy, 100%. Mm -hmm. We had no errors on that one. Okay. In the poll book, we only had five errors. And that's improved greatly from what we normally do. That included what? That improved greatly from what oh, we did. Improved greatly. Right, right. Yes. Okay. okay, and this is the regional upload sites. Um, these were the, we went to seven sites this time. For the primary, we had eight. We eliminated the Silver Spring Library. It just wasn't conducive to what we needed to do. And this just tells you how many um, polling places were assigned to drop off their memory cards at that site. Where was the site in the only? It was the only library. And this just tells you the number of precincts that we got at certain times. <coughs> we started with 11 and we ended with 264. <coughs> we got the last two by 11.43. So you see the most comes in between 10 and 11. And we had the last few stragglers. And up upload time means when uh, a flash drive has been plugged in and yeah. it's uploaded from the regional center to your... Or downstairs. Yeah. We're up uploading downstairs and at the regional center. So. At these times is when Lisa was pulling the report to see how many she had in.
Thank you. We came close to our 11 o'clock news, yeah. didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> we did great. Excellent. Uh, I, I, I guess uh, a question I had, and this, this uh, didn't cover it, um, the difficulty that we had uh, with the the scanning uh, and, 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 the, and the vote the vote counts for absentee and provisional. Oh, the 850? Yeah. Uh, you, 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 you only covered the election days themselves. Right. The, uh, right. I didn't want to. But, you know, we had to get additional equipment in here and, you know, and still, you know, fl trying to flatten the ballots, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, um, that, uh, well, in... Uh, IT's report, she did cover that in the last paragraph, um, not on the scanning, uh, not in the PowerPoint presentation, but in her report, um, we did talk about the fact that the 850 failed and that uh, they had to um, they brought in uh, a specialist uh, as well as bringing in an additional um, unit. Uh, right. 850, so that we fell behind and uh, talked about the need to change the process in terms of uh, managing the ballots as they came, they come up in the ballots that we don't have to do okay, fold, unfolding them and folding them. Um, we that is discussed in her report, but you're right, it was not covered in the PowerPoint. Uh, I guess my question is, what do we anticipate in the future with regard to that? Um, well, um, one of the things that um, I recommended to the state is that for jurisdictions as large as Montgomery and Prince George's, that we should have two ES 850s. Um, the other issue that Kevin has talked about before is our ability to open and stage these absentee ballots to allow them to flatten. Um, ES and S has suggested that um, they're going to put together a video to show us the correct procedures to open <laughs> an envelope and flatten the ballots. Um, I don't think and that was the issue, do you? Well, no, I don't. In fact, I was <laughs> a little bit offended by it. But um, Yeah, but it probably doesn't hurt to just kind of check that off and then they can't I know. raise it again. I know, and we yeah. will. We will follow their their suggested procedures. Um, so, uh, but the really and truly, um, the fact we lost basically two days uh, when the 850 went down. Um, we followed the specific guidelines on how that 850 should be set up um, and we started having problems almost immediately. When they brought in, and then uh, John Spears from the State Board was on site, we had an ESS, ESNS tech there, we got one of the vice presidents came in, uh, then one of the top uh, top project managers from EOS and S came in and that's when they they started looking at the specific instructions and Janet you can correct me when I'm wrong they came in and they started looking at the way that the 850 was supposed to be set up mm -hmm. and immediately told us that there were some changes that had to be made and so have we um, set it up wrong or they had to make changes in the state way. board gave us very specific instructions to the point that we couldn't even move the unit a centimeter right. and we practically had to have it glued down <laughs> and the fact of the matter is is that they came in and they changed a whole lot of different things now when we were trying to get the unit to run we made some changes but we had the es and s person Actually, we had three of them there watching us make these changes. And then on Friday morning, the pro from Dover showed up, and he set up the units for the greatest amount of efficiency. 
Right. He well, went in and made a minor adjustment to something internally that we are not allowed to touch. We have to let the SNS do it. Did, has there ever been any sort of resolution as to what the root cause problem was? Because Montgomery County is, was not alone in this. Um, there were other jurisdictions that had problems with their scanners. And, I mean, yes. it seems like a very delicate piece of machinery that, you know, that, that <laughs> continues to jam. And I don't know. You know, um, I don't know why we would need folding lessons. I mean, I think everyone knows how to unfold this <laughs> paper. Uh, so is it the ballot? Is it the scanner? Or is it? I'm sure both of them are looking at each other, accusing the other of being the well, cause of the problem. <coughs> Where we're at now is ESNS uh, does agree that there was something wrong with their generic server. <laughs> Um, I may not have the right word here. So they went to a the, the computer company um, with regards to identifying what the issues were. That p computer company has identified that this generic piece needs to be replaced with a higher grade piece of equipment. <clears throat> and I don't have the correct notes in front of me. Um, driver. driver, that's it. A generic driver versus a some sort of specific driver. So that is one of the changes they're going to make. They're also going to improve, they're going to make some changes to the software. And um, they also told us that when we are scanning the ballot, even though it is marketed that it can go in upside down, up, every other different way. The reality is that the best way for it to go in is so that when the uh, portion of the unit that pulls the ballot in, it should be the part of the ballot that has the most blank space so that it will go through cleanly. So that was one of the things that they also recommended in terms of being able to process these uh, ballots a lot more quickly and So you need to teach <coughs> people to process the ballots for the most blank space? No, that's what the IT folks have to do. Our canvas workers or whoever's opening the ballot, when they open the envelope, there has to be unfolded and folded and, and flattened in a specific way. And ESPN <coughs> is going to give us a video on how to do that. And we are going to integrate that into our new training program for the Canvas workers. I, I think if, and I'll just go ahead and give my opinion on this one. I don't think we're going to find the thing. I mean, I, I think that we have, from our experience with it, certain things that we're pointing to as the apparent problems, the ESNS. It shakes their head and looks at us like we're crazy when we say this was a problem because in their experience that should not be the problem but I, I mean it seems as though there's a combination of these adjustments to the 850 which their techs made had to be the ones to make but we're insisting that that should not have caused the problems that we had it must have been the way you folded or you know there were there's the placement of the folds, there's the length of the ballot. I mean, there's just, a, there's a whole lot of different combined factors that I think if you look at Maryland's ballots and Maryland's experience with the 850 is, I don't know if that was, you know, unique and unique to that one election and what other adjustments may be made so that we prevent that from requiring the adjustments that it, re I mean, we were able to take that combination of circumstances and get it working. But exactly which thing was the fatal problem that caused it to take so much time and so many adjustments? It, everybody seems to disagree on which the primary problems were, but ultimately <coughs> we were able to get the right configuration of all of it to work. So we can learn from and repeat that. It'd be nice if the vault, if the folds were in different places. It'd be nice if the ballots were, you know, not as long. It would be nice if we made a lot of changes, but you know, a lot nice of changes we can't make. If they would develop a machine that people with the machinely <laughs> like brains would develop a machine that took their ballot. It seems to me that would be the ideal thing we asked for. And it did ultimately once everything was adjusted. Even though people were shaking their heads and saying that should not what? have been the thing to cause it. 
one company makes the ballot and one company makes the scanner. Well, but so, so it would be nice if they, it would be nice if they worked together. But. Well, let me, Doesn't make there were sense. two different printers. The ballots we were having problems with were the runback ballots, whereas the ballots that were printed and the ones that were used on election day and even in early voting were printed by, um, is it SOS? Um, I think that's the name of the state printer. Um, single source, single something source. Um, and they, and we had no problems with those ballots at all. Those were the in-house ballots, those were the election day ballots, those were the early voting ballots. The ballots that we were tearing our hair out about were the run back ballots. And they tested those ballots. They tested the weight. They tested the only thing that was different about those ballots was allegedly, and I, I can't remember who told me this, um, so you know I'm not committing any huge crime, but um, was the grain of the paper. Oh, didn't we hear that the paper changed from the tests to the actual paper used? There was a slightly different quality? Well, there, no. I mean, yeah, there are two different uh, manufacturing processes, but the paper weight, the quality of the paper met the specifications of the state board of elections and ES&S &S licensing requirements for anyone who prints ballots for ES&S &S equipment. And the only thing, as I said, that I heard in the conversation was the difference between the two ballots was the grain of the of the paper. Were the problems experienced in Prince George's and Howard the same as the problems we had or were they different? They were different. Um, mm -hmm. There was, in Prince George's County, there was a flaw on the lens that was giving a false toll. They did have a scratch in their lens. Scratch yeah. in they the had lens. to rescan things because of that. And then uh, another county had where the fold was was exactly on the oval and it was reading a false overvote. That was, I think, Howard County. That's the two I've spoken to. But we also, we were not slowing down the speed. We did not slow down the pick rate, right? And Frederick County had no problems because they slowed, or they said, well, we had no problems because we just slowed down the pick rate on the machine. And then the vendors folks looked at them and said, there's no reason to do that. You shouldn't do that. You should never slow down the pick rate. So, I mean, we all like rigged up different solutions to the problem that accomplished different ways of getting there, of, of getting it scanned. We requested the slowdown, and the ES&S was slowdown. They wouldn't do it. No, right. we're not doing it. Really? Yeah. Hmm. And different counties solution. handled it different ways. I mean, um, it's my understanding that uh, Anna, uh, Anne Arundel County um, was very inventive and uh, kind of removed a certain pieces of the equipment to make it function and then they also gave up and started using the ballot marking device and they started hand you know duplicating other ballots i mean they they kind of did an across the board approach that they were throwing everything at it why don't we see if we can hire that person to come over and help us on election day i think he's probably got his hands full over there <laughs> Well, on, on ballot opening, I, I, I may have heard this. Where is it? Remember, we, we tried to get opening ballots before the polls closed. You know, where right. is that? Is that anywhere? Well, it's it's in the state election law article that you can't start opening right absentee ballots until the Tuesday, the, the Thursday after the election. But there was an effort to. That's right. We didn't we send a letter? Yeah. There's yeah. a statute. I'm just wondering where the election code. The election code. Right. In the election law, it, it says that we can stage the ballots. It doesn't Correct. say we can open them. Right. But we can stage the ballots. I thought there was a bill to them. There was no. We wanted, we wanted legislation introduced. I believe this was. Uh, we we discussed this at our meeting, and we brought it up last month. And I know we had issues on that that we wanted Kevin to look into the law on. Well, we didn't we want to know whether it was the law or regulation or at what yes. what what the stick what, where it came from? 
my notes reflected at the last board meeting you had asked for staff to put together a plan and come back to you with proposals for exactly when we would want to start open opening. ballots and kind of give you some more detail on how exactly we would like to to do this and before we proceed and I think realistically time wise because this will probably require legislation we're looking at this for the 2020 election right. uh, it's not anything that could be in place for, for 2018 but yeah but if, if we if we could figure out uh, legislatively what we need to do I mean is there legislation and regulation or can can you just can you just do it through regulation? It's, it's both. You th it's, I, I it's thought it was supposed in, to. In the election law article and in common. Okay. We mentioned one time, um, Kevin, and you and I talked about it. I know uh, the fact that with the changing technology, the regulations desperately need to be upgraded. Is that a fact? Oh, I I think most of the election law article needs to be redone. And it's, it's trying to take statutes and processes that were used for election systems, you know, for election system cycles ago. It's not, it just doesn't, it's just sort of this sort of patch here and patch there when a new system comes into place. And quite frankly, when you read it, it's internally inconsistent. What would be the process? Should there be... Uh, study committees compro comprised of you and four other uh, counties' attorneys to come up with the list of things and then present it to the legislators? Well, that or, I mean, I, I, it'd be nice, quite frankly, if there would be some sort of task force that was established to go ahead and review it. Review I think the, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, review the entire election law. I mean, there are things that, I mean, just, you know, even in the time that I've been the board attorney, the, the, even just petitions, the timeline for petitions now is totally unrealistic. You could not possibly get a petition filed, processed, and through the court system because in the intervening time, the MOVE Act has come into play. You need to have ballots printed much earlier than you, right. than you did mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Uh, everything's been moved up. So when you have deadlines to say you can have a charter amendment submitted the second Monday in August, well, you have ballots that need to go out at the end of August. So how in the world are you going to be on a schedule that's going to go ahead and allow that to happen? It's totally unrealistic. Is the charter amendment deadline in the charter? It's in it's in the election law article. Oh, okay. Would yeah. the way to go about it be for us uh, to request the governor to put together that kind of task force? That would be a good idea, yeah. And I think... I. I'd like to make a motion that we ask the governor to put together a task force to review the election laws in view of in, in with the light in like with the light of updating them. Is it the governor or the legislature? Well, it sounds like what you're talking about is would involve both, mm -hmm. um, and also is much more likely to succeed if it involves both. Well, I would think that the legislature would have to be involved. Well, yeah, I mean, it seems to me if we, if the governor were to create a commission of some sort to review it and then make uh, legislative recommendations that's that would go what forward. I, I, that's what I thought I said. I, maybe I didn't. No, I wasn't no, no, clear no, about it. It. It, is, it is what you said. I guess I'm, what I'm suggesting is, is that I think the kinds of things that Kevin is talking about, which are strictly the technical, not the political, right. um, I think that the only way for an election law change to succeed is to stick to that, you know, because other, otherwise it's going to it just turns into a big battle back and forth. Um, and I'm not sure if that's possible without involving both the governor. Well, and the governor would. I would be shocked if the governor didn't have the House appoint a couple of people and the Senate appoint a couple of people and, and do the way you usually do those tasks for Yeah, I would think a request, for. though, should come from three or four of the largest counties, not just Montgomery. Well, how do we do that, Jim? I'll call them. I know yeah, all the presidents. To coordinate with them, yeah. I think that's... I talk to these guys It would be an incredible idea. Yeah. Prince George's. Howard. Yeah. Anna, Anna Rundle. Baltimore oh, well, County. Baltimore, Baltimore County. City. 
Baltimore City. Baltimore. But I think you'd want to have some people like Kevin who practice election law and are intimately familiar with the statute to be part of that task force. Well, of course, but we can't yeah. tell the governor who to put on it. Yeah, that's true. Except informally. I can, I'll call these five presidents and see if they're willing to join us and report back. And you may want to, to reach you. out to Mr. McManus. Dave, okay. To who? Dave, Dave McManus. McManus. The president of the state. And I, I will report back in April. And if they would like to get together and discuss any other issues when we're at one of these meetings, it seemed to be an appropriate time. Yeah. The, uh, I will the, call them the and report meeting, back to you. I know Ann McNeil is the attorney of Baltimore City. That's what she wanted to do. She wanted to spend the attorney time coming up with a list of proposed changes to well, that would be perfect in like with this. And, put it together. And, and also bylaws, because she has a real problem with the, 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 the bylaws that were prepared by. Okay. Well, why, by the, this, why are you saying it in the past tense? You say she wanted to do that. Is she well, she, to do she that? still wants to do it. Oh, okay. She still wants to do it. Um, it sounds like a great idea. But that's what, and that was going to be the focal point of, of the attorney roundtable if we were going to. Well, it seems to me that would be a perfect thing that, if we did well, this. Well, that would be. We would have at least a beginning list to, to give them of things that needed to be addressed. And, yeah, let me see uh, if and I have to. put on that list because I spent a fair amount of time with Jeff Darcy when we were doing this petition thing uh, okay. last year was the idea of why we need a quorum present when you have people sitting there that are opening and duplicating ballots. In other words, if they're not going to have the technology to go ahead and do that, why can't there be some, why can't it be set up that board members come in at 6 or 7 o'clock at night, review those that are going to be possible rejects or need voter, you know, voter intent issues resolved and handle it that way rather than having a board, a quorum there from set 9 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock in the morning till 7 o'clock at night when the reality is anyone who watches these canvases, the, the, the re there's no need for, for board members to be there watching what I would view be a very much a ministerial task of simply opening them up and duplicating them. I, you don't think there should be one Democrat and one Republican board member well, at least? Or, or maybe one of those? Not in each room, though. I think, I think to be present in the facility where it's being done, uh, uh, and Rome, you know, yeah. one of each where you can come five with this. Yeah, I, yeah, no, I, mean, I think there should be people. some board presence, yeah. though. Well, um, I just think that, you know, it, it's, it's easy for it's easy for the state board to say, no, we you need to have a quorum there. But, I mean, the reality is, is it, 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 it really is, doesn't make any sense. It really does not make any sense. Well, not when you have our problems for the lengths of time. I mean, you know, probably Kent County has two hours worth. Yeah, they're done by lunch. You know. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, Cecil County, done. Yeah. Well, I was talking to the, the election director in uh, Charles, and she says for all the ballots they need duplicated, they just go to a ballot marking device and punch them in. And yep. They're done. But they don't have any to do. Well, I think it would be lovely and if we could get them if they're going to the either one of the meetings mayo uh well i'll call i'll call these people uh, by the next meeting and report back to you yeah, see if they're interested could montgomery county doing something by itself won't get any uh push i think that's exactly right jim i don't know when the right time is but um we were given a, a list of uh, where our election judges live by zip code that I wanted to ask some questions about. Is that the next topic, early voting? No, I don't think it's on the agenda. I don't know if it's part of the early voting topic. I think it, it was, it's a follow-up from last month. Okay. Are we done with um, technology? Yeah, we're done with information technology. All right, David. Yeah. Might as well do it now. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And what 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 is what what do we have in front of us? Okay, the, and why? What what we got in our advanced packet, which I believe um, we requested at our meeting last month. Please tell me if I have this right. Um, was a list of where the judges live 
Um, and then we also got a map showing kind of where the concentration of judges were, because we were looking at that in terms of where the training might be in order to oh, be convenient for where the judges are coming from. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, right, and then, but, but, the, but the chart that we got um, in the advanced packet specifically said that it excluded election judges who reside elsewhere in the state of Maryland, but the, but the map did not. So the map did show that there were people, and I actually was surprised to know that we had a, a pretty significant, I counted 76 on this. Today we got a chart that included the people from Frederick, Prince George's, and if Mallard, it's, the Prince George's, if it's not 208, it's not us? If it's not 208 or 209, I believe it's not us. Oh, okay. So I believe the 207s and 20s, I don't know what the 206s is. So Montgomery County is 208s and 209s. Right. Not all 209s, are they? I think almost all. Okay. Um, but then the other thing is if you look at the map that was distributed with the advanced packet, it becomes very clear that there's a lot of people who are concentrated um, in the southern part of Montgomery County and in the eastern part of Montgomery County, um, and which I guess was part of the, um, what the discussion was last month. Yeah, was, right. It was about, um, with the countervailing problem being, um, I guess, the cost of, faci of a facility and, and and the time that's involved for, um, I, I, don't, I don't know, I, I'm not the best person to, to, to summarize it all, but that was, I think that was the, the, the reason for the, for the information. And the information will help us to do what? Well, what um, what Gracie and I had advocated last month um, uh, was to encourage a greater number of training sessions outside of this building uh, in order to, in order to make it more convenient for um, for our, our judges and potential judges. Um, and as I understand it, part of the concern there is the cost of facilities. Um, but um, Margaret can tell you much better than I can. Do you not have training sessions if there's fewer than X number of people, and do you limit it to a maximum? Yes, there's a maximum. I don't know if there's a few. I've seen some pretty sparse training sessions. Um, I think the lowest number I've ever seen is four people. Oh, that is sparse. Um, <clears throat> so. And that, what's the maximum? Uh, well, the ideal is 20, but I know that um, Leslie will add up to 20, 25. And do they need to have a table to, to uh, uh, do they need to write, or, I mean, what does a facility, when you talk about the size of a facility, what do the people that are being trained have to have besides a chair? Do they need to have things like they the school and chair? They need to have a poll book. They yeah. need to scan. So they, they need, need to have. They need, they need to them. have a table, they or they need to, to have school a school they need to have chairs. The black cart. They need everything. So it's essentially like setting up a polling place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are we looking into additional training sites? Or? Well, there are three training rooms in this building. Right. This building was provided to us for purposes of doing the training and we are developing the calendar for the 2018 election cycle. So we will be looking at sites as we always do uh, in the upcoming, uh, for the upcoming year. For training? For training. Oh. But uh, what other sites off, off site? Well, it's, it has to be at no expense. Can all of that has to be moved and, and, to any off-site yeah, that was space. said over and over again yeah. last month. Um, uh, Margaret, is that yeah. correct? Everything that yeah. you have here has to be moved to an off-site space? Yes. It, basically, we've got to schedule trainers to come in and take the time to pack up the supplies and get them all into the truck, and we've got to rent the truck because the, we've got to get a truck that's got a lift in order to hmm. get the black carts out from our warehouse and into the truck and then get it to the off-site. I think we've done off, we've certainly done off-site at locations that don't have a loading dock for us to readily move that black cart, um, but that's somewhat problematic and I've been worried about injury. When How does Alberto do it? Alberto doesn't, doesn't take an entire polling place and 24 poll books. And training. 
um, I'm trying to think what he, he has. He has taken machines. Yeah, yeah he has. I mean, he yeah. brought he brought everything to my I can, place. Well, I can stick did. a machine in the back of my van, but I can't take a whole black cart and 24 pull books and all of the materials we need to set up a. Oh, for the training. training. Uh, yeah, I see. Um, so there's, I mean, there's the time involved. And there's renting the truck. There's and there's the time and staff time involved in moving <clears> that equipment to the offsite location. And then it's not really cost effective to do that for a single day. So then we've got to have a place at the facility where it can be stored and maintained securely for the course of, I think, a week is, a, is generally what Seven we're days. able to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we've, certainly in my tenure here, I don't know that we've, maybe we have succeeded in getting two weeks straight somewhere. But, not for a you know. While. So it, it, it's not possible to do for a weekend? I mean, because I, I, I would think that a lot $3, of the, the cost expense. per student, the cost per student is going to be different if you're packing up and moving all of right. the operation for two days versus for seven days. Right. Can you get a place down county when I look there with all of this right there that ha you can leave them that you can set up a polling training place? Because they most of these people are down county. Well, Montgomery College, Tacoma Park, we use Silver Springs. That you can building we uh, use. permanent, like for the well, for the duration that you need to have the closet there and whatever, so things only have to be moved in once. You have this alternative training site but down. You have to lease it. Hmm? You have to lease it. Well, it, but did you, Montgomery County, that's what I'm asking. Is there one place that you know of that we could lease closet space and it doesn't cost? It's not a closet. I mean, simply, whatever. You're not talking about a closet. You're talking about taking over an entire classroom, classroom. plus storage space. And if you're looking at, it doesn't make any difference if it's a private location or if it's a public location. You're taking, you're going, there's going to be some sort of cost. Now the county does not charge us because we are a county agency. Um, but if we go to, um, and, and this, the college doesn't charge us either. But the bottom line is, is that if we move to, we're taking something else out of service. So let's say we move to White Oak, all right, and we set up for seven to ten days. That means that whatever uh, events that were go, they're scheduled to go on in that time period have to be shifted to another location. That's how come we try so hard to try to make sure that we schedule these locations far enough in advance that we don't disrupt recreation schedule. Additionally, as you may or may not recall, we had the yoga lady from Lawton come and say, not only are you taking over early vote, the site for early voting for X amount of days, but then we had had a, we had a week of training or seven days of training there. So the, uh, the position of the county is, if you're going to use that site as a uh, recreation, if you're going to use a recreation site or an early voting site, you should select another site for, for training. Uh, for training. Yeah. So we go to the Bethesda Regional Center, or we go to White Oak, or mm -hmm. we go to Long Branch, or we go to the college. To kind of spread it out so it's not all in one place. Yeah. Right. So that, we, and quite honestly, come May, June of next year when we will be doing serious training, May, June is also the height of graduation time and the kids are going to come out of school and they're going to have their little programs at recreation. So, you know, there's going to be a tremendous amount of pushback from recreation. And so we would probably need to just plan that any of the training that's on going to be down county is going to have to be at the front end of the process and because you know we have graduation parties and I mean we we like Silver Spring uh, this last go around we had it Monday through Friday we had to move everything out lock it down uh, secure it and uh, and then there were different parties held on Saturday and Sunday and we and we could come back in on Monday after the cleanup and do the second couple of or we did a couple of days further there. So, but the other piece of it that's an, an important element of renting the budget, rent, renting a lift truck, moving it down there, getting everything shifted down there, and then renting the same truck.
for uh, to get it all back. And that's an expense, and it's not a budgeted expense. I appreciate the fact that we need to extend as much uh, training outside of the county, but we're limited by the amount of money that we're budgeted. And part of moving here with three training rooms is the county gave us a training facility and yes we try very hard to have two three four weeks worth of training outside of this facility but we can't shift it all out of here because that's what this building was brought to us and, for. and and i'm certainly not suggesting shifting it all out of here i do know that for many of the people who live in the down county area that has a lot of our judges according to this map that to get here for a 7 o'clock p.m. training um, going up 270 um, is, you know, is a challenge. Um, and so the more that we offer alternatives, and I personally don't have a problem with saying that, you know, um, if you want to be, have it be convenient, it be on the earlier side. I mean, I think that we should do what we can to, to try and have options for people, and then I think we should inform people of all of their options. But, um, but from my perspective, um, I think that this map made, makes the point pretty clearly that there are a lot of people, um, you know, that we would be we'd be making it um, convenient for them if we were to if we can find convenient times and places um, that are that are closer for them, we may be able to recruit more people, especially at a time when we're going to have our election in late June, and we know although we don't need as many judges as we need for the presidential, we're going to have challenges that we also don't have for the presidential because of being vacation time. time. Yeah. I do want to point out that Leslie does send out a <coughs> periodic uh, email, email blast, in which she does share with the potential election judges uh, where we're going to schedule training. So um, there is an effort made on the part of the election judge recruiters to let people know in advance. But again, what we the, the most important message that we can pass on to the election judge, uh, potential election judge, is that we want you to sign up as early as possible, attend your training, get your materials, so that you can, number one, select the polling place that you wish to work at, mm -hmm. and uh, you get your, your uh, stuff all of your training in place and done and you so that you know who your team is and we really push our chief judges to do yeah. that and, and, and I, I have no problem with encouraging uh, people to, to, to do it early what about the uh, Bethesda uh, site um, what's it called the Bethesda the service site. Site. yeah the regional we do that. I don't we didn't have it last time I, I believe we had it in the primary I don't believe we had it in the general. in the general right it is a hard site to get to in terms of getting our equipment up oh to getting the yeah, equipment the but it, well it's a great site for a lot of people to get to because right. Metro is literally right there and a parking garage and although it's okay, right garage. right next to it yes yeah we, I don't disagree with that statement. and um, I know yeah. that's an area where we need judges I mean the whole Bethesda, you know, going up the <coughs> that's western part. Um, so I will check with Leslie on um, the Bethesda Regional Services Center in particular, and then if there are other sites that <coughs> board members have in mind, I know she's in the process of verifying the availability of the sites that she knows of and that she's planning to use. I think, you know, identifying the sites that can really give us that seven day or more well, we obviously don't know who can give the seven-day availability. Right. Um, I know that when we discussed this last month, we talked about the possibility of a White Oak or a Prasoner or a Mid-County where apparently a lot of the numbers are for... Um, for yeah, and a Prasoner or Mid-County, we run into the, I mean, like you said, the yoga classes and things that... <coughs> right. Well, and, and obviously, I mean, the earlier we ask, the more likely we are to find something. There's no way of knowing what's available otherwise. Um, on, on a, on and a, well, yeah. and since but those are early on voting list, sites, so. right? Right. Right. Uh, uh, put put Bauer on the list. Which is not an early. Voting which site. is not an early voting site. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point. And tell her not to forget the up county too. Right. 
Right. Although I mean, the, and one of the other yeah, things, just to, the for the too. purposes of all the considerations being on the table, I mean, one of our other challenges, this last time we had, we had off-site training at two different locations simultaneously and supporting three classrooms here and two classrooms, so five classrooms total means having that many trainers simultaneously. Uh, we ran into some overtime, and we were running some pretty serious overtime that week that we were, and it was a bit of a strain on personnel to, you know, so there's kind of a, there's a balance in our, our hiring and how many people we can have in a given week, um, you know, and not allow anybody to be taking time off while we're trying to, you know, get spread too thin. So, um, you know, I think personally, I think five, two simultaneous off-site sites was a strain, um, you know, and so that's a, that's a challenge to work around if we end up identifying sites that we're trying to do simultaneously. Yeah, a week that here, a week sense. there is much easier than two weeks sure. simultaneously. But the county executive, when we met, well, he's, he's sensitive to the need for more judges. So anything yeah. we can do to... Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and including increasing their pay, apparently. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so um, I'm just curious, why do we hire so many people from outside of Montgomery County? I, I realize that the law says that we can hire people from throughout the state, but I'm kind of, um, I'm just kind of curious as to what are the, you know, when is it that we hire people who live in, in surrounding counties to work in Montgomery County on Election Day? I, I haven't really looked. My feel is that a lot of them have been long-serving poll workers here who moved, election judges who've served here before. A lot of them are county employees that work in Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. And we get a lot of people that, some went for PG and we've heard like, we just didn't like their program, we like Montgomery County better. That's their saying. You know, just, they just want to work here. So they, or they work out here and they said easier to come here. I think at the time, those who have sort of a, you know, the time invested in their relationships and their polling place, they, they stick where they served. Did they get paid more here? Not no, not sure. Sure. No. no, not according to yeah. what we gave to the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> county executive. I mean, they get more like elsewhere. Have, it looks like we have 76 people who are coming here from, from out of Montgomery County, including, uh, I think I saw one that was as far away as Baldwin County, um, which is... Uh, Obviously, un unusual. <laughs> Very well. That I mean, that might. I, and I don't know because I haven't yeah. checked into it. But that could also be somebody whose residential address is up there, but they're going to college down here, or it, its residential addresses were pulled too. Can you check with Leslie and uh, get us an answer at next meeting? Just out of curiosity, why? I've talked to two women, why are they two women that did this at one polling place, and one of them said she wanted to come down and spend the, a couple of days with her kid in or her daughter. And that she could spend the night at her daughter's, and it was just kind of fun to be down here in the county. And that's the reason she came down and did it. You know, I, I suspect we export some too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say I agree with Janet. Um, I, now I know that probably the vast majority of these are county employees, but I've also heard you know people say to me that the reason they uh, come here to work is because they originally li lived somewhere in Montgomery County and they just want to work at their old polling place to see their old neighbors. Okay. Makes sense to me. Okay. Because a lot of what they, except for the November presidential election, a lot of the uh, draw of doing this job is the socialization. Yeah. Uh, while we're on the subject of, of training, which this, this was part of, uh, when I was reviewing the minutes uh, from, from last month, uh, we had quite a discussion on, uh, on training and uh, judges feeling that they didn't think they were trained enough or they were, you know, had some hesitancy on things or questions. And, uh, and then, you know, we were reviewing the, the comments and we, we were also reviewing um, uh, the, the number, there was a large number in our, our ratings of the, of the judges that fell into the fair category in the, in the, in the middle range type of thing. Uh, before we get into the throes of the next election cycle, uh, I'm wondering, and I, you know, would like to hear from my colleagues here on the board, um, if we could, if, if there could be a training session 
for the board members uh, that would replicate the training uh, that, that, that's given. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you all think that would be worthwhile. I to, would love it. Yeah. To, I would love to it. See I don't mind coming to a training session, but I don't want to. But not something it. done special for us uh, that, that, that over and above, and, and I know since I went through the regular training myself, uh, you know, but, but, but to have us go through <laughs> the, the regular you. training and really, you know, see. Uh, if there are areas that we we spot where you know, gee, maybe you need to go into this a little more, or maybe you know, I have questions on this. Mary, or that. let me ask you to clarify. You're talking about doing that now before before the regular because we yes, can go to the regular yes. training. I'm talking regular, about maybe talking sometime about this summer. Or, you know, I mean, I know people go away or whatnot, but at a time that's not wildly busy for you know you all and uh, and us and whatever. And just just put together a, a a training session. Now you know it's a couple of hours. <laughs> it's like uh, five hours. The uh, well, that's if you do everything. Well, yeah. For you okay. to learn it, you need to learn everything. Um, okay with I would suggest two things. I I have no problem doing this at all. Um, number one, uh, I would suggest that. We wait until, because right now we do have committees working through mail and the state board as well as uh, here that are looking at fine-tuning the training uh, for the upcoming election. Obviously, we are not in any position to give you any training for 2018 with regards to the ballot management system because we're still waiting from the state as to how they're going to try to um, help us manage that issue. Additionally, there are some decisions that the board is going to have to make because you have 15, 15 or 30, I can't remember, I think it's 30 uh, combined precincts that have splits. The precinct is a split between two legislative districts or two council districts. And so the question that's going to come before you as board members is, do we split these precincts into two different locations to prevent voter error, uh, to prevent election judge error so that the voter does not get the wrong ballot? What we did in the last election, as you recall, is any precinct that had two different congressional districts, we split them apart to prevent anyone from handing out the incorrect congressional district. We have 32 precincts um, that you know, we don't have to worry so much about the Board of Education precincts because there they run districts. jurisdiction law wide. Right. But handing out an incorrect legislative district or handing out an incorrect county commissioner district or county council district, that's going to have some severe problems mm -hmm. after the fact. So we plan on coming forward to the board in May uh, with regards to how do you how do you wish for the board staff to proceed to deal with these issues? Um, I'm, you know, strongly recommending that we split them apart. And that's going to do things like uh, Garrett Park is a split between two legislative districts. So, and, and I don't want to get into that discussion, but you mm -hmm. put them together and now we're going to have to tear them back apart again. Okay, so the when we come in to you in May with these issues. These are some of the things that you need to think about. Does split apart mean a different building or a different room or it could mean either? It could mean, it depends what is there. Right. So it could be a different, I mean, if we do a different room then there's going to have to be, there's going to have to be, yeah. No, and, it's not going to be signed. Yeah, you need we're someone to check people in. We're going to yeah. have to, let's say, let's say Garrett Park. Okay. Okay, because that's the simplest one. We all know what the problem is there. You have a lot of voters. So what's going to probably have to happen is smack dab at the front of the building where people all come in. We're going to have to check them in and say, let's say we keep it in the same building. You go over to the okay. multi-purpose -pur right. room, right. you go down to the gym, right. and you send them that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, or maybe we should put them in two different locations. You know, Garrett Park and the Kensington Town Hall. I, you know, I'm not being realistic, but that's an option. 
so these are these are issues that are coming up because I will tell you based on my personal experience of going through a recount particularly on the legislative side you know and I know I'm not supposed to pay attention to politics but this upcoming legislative session and the people that will be elected will be very closely involved in redistricting and both political parties are going to have both their daggers out and it will be a bloodbath <laughs> so what I'm trying to do is prevent the bloodbath from occurring here in the, the certification process and canvassing of the election result yes our election judges are going to try to make will make mistakes in innocence but let's try to build as many preventative measures into this process so that that doesn't occur. Do we have any control over the poll books? Because it could be done at that point. Uh, somebody's name is A in this precinct and somebody's B in another precinct and the people say you go here or you go there. When they get there, that's it's too there. late. I, with all due respect, it's there. We had two precincts that were combined and it's there in the poll it's book. It's already in the it's, poll book. And it's on the ballot. You know, it says, pick up, pick this ballot, and they didn't do it. Okay, and, and guess what? That is a universal problem across the nation where anybody has split precincts. Allison, she had, when she was in D.C., you had all these little commissions handing mm -hmm. out. I mean, I came from a jurisdiction that had over a thousand split ballots. And the only thing that we ever screwed up, Jennifer, they screwed up, was the school district lines. Because they still have one room schoolhouses out there. I don't know if you Well, I mean, it was a nice thing about the TS units, was that that little card came right out of the poll book saying which ballot style you get. But now that we've got humans that have to pick the right yeah. piece of paper off of the right Separate stack, locations are first thing in the morning. I mean, the errors were, the errors were in the morning rush. It was when the election judges were first opening packs and trying to address those voters swarming in first thing in the morning. That's when they made errors and then they called in usually a half an hour later confessing that they just messed up and handed the wrong ballot styles to voters. But Margaret, that would mean maybe creating up to 32 new precincts? To add to it would be if you split them and one stayed where, stayed there, and the other one we had to go to another location. Yeah, 15 or 16 new locations. But you know, like I said, I haven't had time. I mean, we know it's a problem. We're still trying to wrap up this election. We're trying to help the state prep for the next election, plus manage the legislation and making sure that we're staying on top of that. And so we know that this is coming and we plan on presenting it to you Good. in May. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you. Um, um, the early voting site status. David, you asked that to be presented. Yes, I wanted to get a sense from, I, I think we asked you all to let us know um, where you are in your, in, in your thinking about um, the early voting sites. Well, basically, all we've done is notify the county recreation as well as the community use of uh, public facilities uh, what the dates are for 2018 and to not schedule anything uh, at any of those uh, rec centers we've used in the past. And um, also to be aware that other rec centers may be put into play because we have at least one new site, maybe two, and that's really where we're at. Um, well, we staff, did. Yeah, we, we, we have to talk about Wheaton. Uh -huh. yeah. So staff is requesting that we be allowed to report to the board in May of 2017 at the same time we discuss the precincts and the early voting sites and the precinct adjustments. Um, that's what we're requesting, Mr. President. We can't use Wheaton again, that's correct? As I've been advised at this time, no and the Wheaton Community Center slash library will not be completed. Well, I, uh, in terms of Wheaton, I would like to strongly recommend that uh, Wheaton Plaza be looked at in a big way. Uh, 
all of the malls like that are hurting big time. I mean, you Even know, malls. businesses are, are, are fleeing. Yeah, yeah. malls like yes. that. Yeah. Uh, they can't compete with Amazon. And um, so I would think that it might be good timing to uh, be looking for some space there for, um, yeah. for us for the early voting. And we had looked, you know, before when we... Uh, the last time we looked at uh, at Wheaton at some at some space, um, and um, you know there are a lot of advantages: parking, of course, metro, you know, whatever. But uh, knowing that we have to do something at Wheaton, I would say we need to get over there sooner rather than later and see, you know, what could be possible. Okay, and just something for you to think about. I'm not asking an answer or a discussion at this point, and that is um, one of the issues with the malls traditionally has been they say, okay, uh, this is the mall, and we'll give you this site in June, but down by the J.C. Penney, but at this site by Sports Authority <coughs> for the fall. So it would be, while it would be in the mall, it would be in two different locations. That's one of the issues. The previous boards have said, no, it's got to be in the exact same location. Well, so just think about it. I, I, rea I realize that, but I think, I think it's uh, a different time in regards to the mall now, too, and they may not have such a stringent requirement for us. They may be glad to get a place, you know, signed, sealed, and delivered for that time. Um, also, I think that I, I, I've been present when... Uh, County committees have gone to the state and gotten a uh, waiver, if you will, from the same location uh, regulation for the primary and the general election for a site, and uh, you know where where there's a situation that required it. And I think if 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 we're in the same mall uh, and it's just a different location within, I I'd, I'd be willing to think that that we could get that approved. Is that the only early voting site that is a red flag? The rest are no no red flags or warnings? You know, I'm going to say I can't give you a clear answer on that because I'm still waiting from ES and S okay. to give us information on daisy changing these ballot marking devices as well as to look at the ballot marking devices and uh, the electrical requirements that each of those units uh, is required in terms of the draw. So when you said that you notified the county rec department and the community use of facilities office, what does that do in terms of um, holding on to those sites other than, I mean, a notification obviously is not the same as commitment. That's right. Um, and so I guess my question is, because um, obviously we don't have a lot of options if we don't have, I mean, the vast majority of our sites are county rec sites. Um, so I guess my question is, um, what else can we do to try and hold on to those sites until a decision is made? We've notified them that we, first of all, because we're repeat users, right. they, that we want to be notified immediately if someone is trying to encroach on our dates. Right. And then uh, if that's the case, I will notify the board president immediately. And if we need to make a decision right then and there, he'll have to call an emergency meeting. So let's say that somebody wants to use the Silver Spring Civic Center. <laughs> we would probably, right. I would get a hold of Mr. Uh, Shalik and we would go right. and get an emergency meeting because I can't imagine any board member here not wanting to return to that location. Right, although we, as you know, we, we, we did have that as an issue and had to change rooms in the Silver Spring Civic Center because of that very problem. So I'm glad that if we're uh, We've we're asked for the Great Hall. Okay. We've made it clear okay. that only the Great Hall will work. Okay. We're well, especially, and again, this goes back to if we're <coughs> using ballots or are we going to use the ballot marking device? If we have to use ballots and we have 66 to 75 ballot styles, there's going to be a little train of gray carts. It's right. going to have all these different ballots. Right. right. But it also sounds like, given the issues of um, how the ballot marking device works and the fact that that's not completely <laughs> resolved yet, we may not know whether we're using ballots or 
um, marking devices by the time we need to make a decision. Um, I mean, we didn't last time. Well, um, I believe that the state board staff is trying to push ESNS to um, get all of the information to the state board, and as I said, we will have ESNS here next month with the new um, software so that you can see it. Because if you don't want to use it because you feel that the toggling is not uh, conducive to regular voters understanding how to use it, then we need to know now. Because then we have to purchase more, more equipment for ballot storage. We can't, I mean, and the other part of it is, is that if we are going to use the ballot marking device, um, I believe we're going to need additional ballot marking devices because we're going to have to uh, at least prepare, maybe not for the primary, but for the general, to replace it ballot station for ballot station. So if we had 37 voting stations at Silver Spring, we need to have 30, we need to be prepared to have 37 voting stations for Silver Spring using the ballot marking device. We, so you'd be able to get back to us in May? Yes. And, but ESNS will be invited to attend the April meeting. The April meeting. And we have notified <coughs> recreation and community use with the dates. Yeah, so that, that was going to be my question. How, how about, how about Gaithersburg? Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure Chris has, but I will double check with her. Uh, is Gaithersburg our only one that's not in the other categories? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Well, I have nothing That's else, it. sir. All right. Is there a motion to uh, uh, next uh, week? The date? Um, next month of the board meeting. April 24. Is there uh, any further information for us on, in terms of the Mayo Conference? I know you've, uh, you've made reservations for us, or have a hold on reservations, correct? Um, yeah. Um, did, I can't recall whether what we said last last meeting whether we were going to. I know you're trying to get a final, as close to a final agenda as possible. Were we going to discuss that? Do you recall whether we were going to bring that up again in April? We were going to bring it up in April to try to get the the latest version of the agenda so that a decision could be well, made based on that. It's there. It's on the. I mean, it's on the Mayo website. Okay, so what you can do is provide us a copy of it, and we can send it out sure. to the board members tomorrow. Sure. Okay? You'll see the agenda for June, the June meeting. For the Mayo meeting, yes. And then next month we can discuss it and find out who, who wants to attend so that we can you want to participate move by forward phone? on that. Okay. Might. That's this great. Is where I am. I might be on the road. I'm, oh, let me know. I'd like to do. Yeah, Jackie's not going to be here in May, and uh, we, we have the capability if she wants to participate, we can hook her up by phone. Yeah, mm -hmm, absolutely. Just like, yeah. Okay, I'll call you. <laughs> <laughs> Either one of us. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, you might be on the road, but I'm... Oh, right, let me, uh, is there anything else? Okay, is there a motion to adjourn? I move. Second? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 No one opposed? Okay.